Hello and welcome to episode 424 of Retro Encounter, RPG Fans' weekly podcast of many topics. I'm Mike Solosi, and here, um, listeners, I know that sometimes you get a little hung up on having the word retro right there in the podcast title. We talk about recent games, or semi-recent games, or games you might not think are retro enough. So this episode is about the PS4, and whether you think that's retro or not, that thing came out 11 years ago. So if you aren't already feeling old, let's listen to the rest of the podcast panel, express how old they feel, <laughs> starting with you, Zach Wilkerson. I'm pretty old, yeah. Hi. And Alex Frenichek. Hello. I might be the least old, but I'm not sure. <laughs> well, let's not compare, please. And also, Kyle Cantillon. Typically the least old, but uh, I'm free to give that, that up to somebody else. That's fine with me. <laughs> uh, Kyle, Alex, Zach, um, this is one of the least least old or less old episodes we're going to do because um, we will be talking about some games in part that only came out a few years ago. But uh, this is another one of our um, ranking episodes in which we take a set of games, in this case, all the catalog of the PS4. And uh, before recording, we came up with a top 10 list based on a uh, pretty simple voting formula. And then uh, and we, we've also done this for the PS2, the PS1, the Super Nintendo, and a couple uh, series like Final Fantasy, Zelda, uh, and, and maybe a few others I'm forgetting. We compiled this list ahead of time, and uh, we arrived at a top 11 because there was a tie for 10th place that I didn't see a reasonable way to tie break. So uh, we're going to um, talk about those 11 games in descending order from the ten weight, from the tie at 10 all the way to our number one highest scoring game. Um, and, and then but also have sort of four honorable mentions, one for the each of us ahead of time. Uh, but before that, let's uh, talk about our individual um, relationships with the PlayStation 4 console. Uh, I'll probably pepper in some information uh, here and there. But uh, starting with you, Alex, um, what's your relationship with the PS4? Yeah, so like uh, most consoles in my life, uh, I got to the PS4 late, uh, a couple of years after its release. Um, I was living, I was doing like uh, undergrad university at the time, I was living with roommates, and my first exposure to a PS4 was actually from my, my roommate who had gotten it for one of his birthdays, and uh, my first game for it was uh, Witcher 3 and Bloodborne simultaneously. Uh, which was honestly like a, a perfect, perfect entry into the That's console. That's pretty good. <laughs> oh yeah, um, and it was like around like 2016 ish, so not too long after those games came out. And uh, Witcher Three, we were all like just playing on our own, like getting like engrossed in our own campaigns and Bloodborne. For that first playthrough, we were kind of like passing controllers around and had like kind of like a fun Souls like communal experience. Um, but yeah, immediately with those two games, uh, they both kind of like I was a little skeptical about like whether a PS4 is worth investing in. Like at like release, it didn't seem like too much more could be done from what the PS3 uh did already with like its graphics, but obviously like even though like the difference in generations isn't quite as drastic at that point. Like there was still like a lot to be done with like what the PS4 was capable of. And uh, yeah, both those games showcased the power uh, in a new way and uh, yeah, really opened up my horizon to the console and um, I was playing it PS4 games like all the time from then on after I got my own finally and uh, had played like every single souls game on it. So that was obviously a pleasurable experience. and. Uh, yeah, in retrospect, the PS4 has quite an amazing library, and uh, yeah, it'll be interesting getting into some of these top games. All right, now, um, Kyle, same question to you. What's your background and relationship with the PS4? Yeah, a little bit similar to Alex. I came at it <clears throat> not from release day for sure. Um, I was just sharing off air that, uh, like like a few other things in life, it was kind of one one game or or one experience that really drew me to it, and so uh, it was Dragon Age Inquisition for me. Then it came out. I, I played it on PS3 for all of, you know, one evening and thought that, well, this hardware clearly isn't powerful enough for this game. And that's my problem. So I need to go and fix that by buying the most advanced piece. Uh, and I did. And I never looked back. Um, the PS4 was with me for uh, sort of my second degree, kind of like Alex was talking about. And uh, it was, you know, formed a, not only like a, a backbone of, 
uh, the sort of some of the social outings that my friends and I would have with different sports games, uh, but also, of course, like a lot of my single player experiences from Dragon Age to, um, to you know, Final Fantasy and everything else in between. So, uh, just a really, a really important, not maybe not the important console for me, but certainly the one that's dominated my uh, my sort of adult years. All right. Well, you know, I'll, I'll take this uh, moment here in between personal histories of the PS4 to talk a uh, couple facts about it. Um, it. It came out in late 2013, and like most Sony systems, uh, it had a between systems lifespan of around six and a half or seven years, which is, you know, longer than the typical five to five and a half years for Nintendo, which is, you know, the Switch is the Nintendo great exception that's lasted longer than six years. But uh, with with Sony systems, they always have around six and a half or seven years between releases, but the tales are different. Um, the uh, with the PS one, they were there weren't a ton of PS one games made after the PS two because the PS two was such a huge success that people couldn't you know start making PS two games fast enough. Uh, and but and but the PS two had a very long tail with like my favorite PS two game uh, came out in two thousand eight, two years after the PS three dropped. Um, PS4 has had a similar long tail to the PS2 because there are PS4 and PS5 cross-generation releases as recently as I think this year, uh, um, it, it maybe last year. And, and for the purposes of this list, I mean, everyone can, uh, the only rule was that it had to have a PS4 release sometime. But for, specifically for me, I wanted to try and contain it to the PS4 era as much as I could. So my, my, in my on my personal top 10 that we used for scoring, all of the games had a release date between 2013 and 2020. Uh, but even though I think one of them had its PS4 release in 2021. So the, the PS4 has had an unusually long full lifespan that isn't all the, and it's not all the way dead yet, which is a little crazy since again, it's been um, almost 11 years since it came out, but going back into my, into my personal history with it, Similar to you guys, I got into it a little bit late. I know exactly when it was. It was my birthday, or maybe just after my birthday, in February or March of 2017. Because I had been uh, stubbornly hanging on to my PS3 and PSP. I didn't want to spend money on a new console if I could avoid it. But then, uh, but my PS3 had been really starting to flag um, playing recent releases. Uh, it, like it, it was noticeably bad load times. And there were just too many PS4 games coming out or uh, already out that I wanted to play. So I got a good deal on a PS4 that came with Uncharted 4 A Thief's End <laughs> in probably March of 2017. And uh, But the one game that I really, really wanted to play on PS4 came out soon, soon after that in English, and that was Persona 5, uh, which finished 10th on my list. So like the game that got me to finish... That got me really into playing games on the PS4. Uh, there's at least nine others that I like more and not, more than Persona Five. But uh, so yeah, um, the PS4 is a hell of a machine, and uh, I'm. It was probably my, the main thing I've been playing games on since 2017 until I upgraded to a PS5 a couple of years ago. And uh, even then, my biggest use of the PS5 is probably playing the PS4 Yakuza games with better load times. But uh, Zach, I'm sure you've played more than just Yakuza games on your PS4. <laughs> uh, but what's your relationship with the console like been over the years? Uh, mine is remarkably similar to yours. Um, I got mine sometime in 2017, and it was basically just like a collection of like, oh my gosh, I have to play this. I have to play this. I have to play this. And eventually I was like, all right, it's time to bite the bullet. Um, and it was right around the release of Nier Automata um, and Persona 5 as well and so obviously that's a pretty good one-two punch to start with uh, i think i played the last of us in there as well um and obviously it's been my primary gaming machine outside of the upgraded ps5 uh since then so yeah it's um it was an important machine for me in a lot of ways like i hadn't been playing games as much maybe like in my early adult life in my like late 20s um and then through my 30s it's basically been like my primary gaming machine and um, where I've just played so many things. Right on. So uh, fellas, I would like to get into our actual list. We've been keeping the uh, listeners on tender hooks for long enough without actually mentioning what games we're going to talk about. And uh, so our overall list is 11. 
but there's four we're going to talk about ahead of time. Uh, each one of us got to pick one game from our individual lists that did not score enough points in our scoring system to make the top 10. So uh, I'll, I'll go with it first. I was, I was sort of alluding to it before, but um, Hades is one of my favorite games of the last 10 years. It finished uh, fifth or sixth on my list. Yeah, yeah, sixth on my list. It was like compare, uh, competing with a lot of other stuff. Uh, but it it uh, it came out on Switch and PC in 2020 and then got its PS4 release a year later. So I played it mostly on Switch, but then replayed a lot of it on the PS4 later. And I think that game is just so special. A, uh, a narrative-focused twisting of the roguelite concept that absolutely worked. Um, absolutely stunning character designs and art style. I think everybody that even likes action RPGs a little bit should play Hades. Not much else to say there. We did an episode on it in uh, early 2021, but uh, I think I was the only one that had it on their list at all, so it uh, didn't have enough points to make it. It's it's deserving though. Uh, I played it on Switch, and it just it was probably like 12th or 13th on my list. Um, yeah, I'm I'm gonna say things. Uh, I'm gonna say this often. I almost put that tenth. I almost <laughs> put that ninth yeah. for uh, for some of the games we're gonna talk about today, which, which is which is true because around the nine or ten spot, there was a lot of different ways my list could have gone, but uh, not not for Hades. Yeah, I, mean, I think it's a perfect like pick up and play game too. Like you can if you have 20 minutes here, half an hour there, do one quick run, and it's not a huge investment. And there, like I, I, I got ten clears, and the fact that I know if I'd gotten a hundred more clears, I would have seen a ton more storytelling and dialogue, is absurd. Um, it's so smooth, it's stylish, it's um, a lot of build variety. I'm really looking forward to playing the uh, final version of Hades too. Oh yeah, I'm I'm not gonna get involved in early access in Hades too, but I, I will, that's a day one game for me once it's uh, oh, on a sure. cons- on a console in a one in a true one version. But uh, 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 Alex or Kyle, do you have any Hades comments or should we move on to the next honorable mention? Yeah, H- Hades is amazing. Uh, I really enjoyed my time with it. Uh, I also just did basically the, the 10 runs and then, and then cut myself off to move on to other things. Uh, but I was still immensely enjoying the game, uh, even with that. Um, but it actually was originally going to be my 10th pick on the list. But then just to make things easier for myself, I, I created a, a criteria rule for myself that I wouldn't include games that were first released on like another console, uh, even if they had originally come out for PC and then uh, were then ported to PS4. So in Hades' case, it had a Switch release first. I really associate that game with the Switch because of how pick up and playable it is. Like sometimes I just do one, like one of the, the four levels of hell and then I just like put my Switch in pause mode and then come back to it later. So to me, that was like a quintessential Switch game. And uh, yeah, I basically just didn't include it to make things easier for myself. Uh, amazing game. Yeah, I mean, <clears throat> a little bit similar to Alex, uh, I thought uh, of Hades a little bit as a Switch game first. Um, didn't quite get into it in the way that a lot of you guys are talking about. I think it was just one of those uh, roguelite walls for me, um, you know, and then a variety of other games are kind of just popping up constantly because uh as is the brand of retro encounter uh, there's just too many games but um i really enjoyed the the brief moments i had with it uh i've actually uh, i don't know if if this is interesting to anybody else or not uh maybe zach uh, i've actually used hades uh in the classroom uh oh, so cool. as a classroom teacher uh, i was responsible for basically doing a little bit of critical thinking with kids and trying to get them to think outside the box and uh treat this concept of how like failure is not um, it's part of the journey, right? So uh, using yeah. roguelike games where... Uh, Perfect game for it. Yeah, basically like being defeated is sort of part of the process uh, and, you know, results in learning, results in um, uh, a lot of, you know, different types of growth, where, whether it's narrative or, uh, you know, progression-based. Uh, cool. And so I've I've kind of taken... I've used that as a sort of a learning tool. Uh, obviously, you have to use it with older kids. Obviously, you have to have make sure that you're you're targeting sort of the right kind of critical thinking skills, but um, but actually that's uh, ironically a little bit where uh, where I come at from from the perspective of Hades and in my perspective in that perspective, any game you can use for education is a okay by me. Right on, it's very cool. Yeah, I mean that that's great. Like, I mean, because you could like say a similar thing about like yeah the the rogue like genre as a whole, but the fact that. 
Hades also bakes that into its its storytelling and like how like the failure is all part of Zagreus's uh character arc is just another cherry on top and another thing that just makes that game so special because I really haven't been able to get into many roguelike games at all uh just like a handful really uh and Hades was one of them just because it it did have that brilliant little usage of its narrative design in terms of like really making the most of the roguelike genre in a way that other games just just didn't were like a lot more just gameplay and mechanics focused so i i really resonated with that part of the game and i think that's really cool but uh speaking of um dying Dorm. yeah yes. dying as a as an educational <laughs> process you, you knew exactly what i, I was did. going for Zach. <laughs> <laughs> all right hit me you know what's coming uh so mine is mm-hmm. dark souls 3 which uh, interestingly is a game that I placed 10th on my list. But after beating today, um, Shadow of the Erd Tree, um, the DLC for Elden Ring, Dark Souls 3 went up in my estimation for a lot of reasons. And and I think that Dark Souls 3 sort of sits at this weird, like sort of nexus point of the series where um, they they start, honestly, especially with this DLC, (laughs) um, leaning into challenge so hard that I think it becomes absurd. Um, and I think Elden Ring started to do that a little bit too. Um, whereas I think some of the earlier games get a reputation for being really challenging, but honestly, if you're patient, they're not that bad. Um, but Dark Souls 3 starts to sort of introduce some of those concepts of, uh, you know, hesitations and um, just absurd combos from bosses, but in a way that is learnable, in a way that is fun, in a way that I, even even with Free Day, I didn't think ever um, frustrated me to the point of like, I, I don't want to do this anymore. So I think that um, it really, like to me, it is the quintessential Souls title. And I know that it doesn't have like the world design of Dark Souls 1 or the open world of Elden Ring, but I think that the boss gauntlet is almost perfect. There's like maybe two or three just like okay bosses, whereas, you know, uh, you you just played the bed of chaos, Salosi. Um, yep, that's I a sure tra- did. That's a trash boss. Um, there are there are like some just like not great bosses in this game, but I think the boss gauntlet is great. I think the world design is really interesting. I really like the way it plays with Dark Souls One lore, um, and I just think that it uh, hits that perfect balance of what the series wants to be or anywhere it goes really well. Um, I've played basically one Souls game a year since uh 2022 and i've not played dark souls 3 yet but every time i play a souls game i want to play more souls games uh, and and uh and we're going to talk about another one later in this episode uh but also i think i need a break because i i i I can't do what you did zach you you beat like all seven of them in something like four or five months last year and (laughs) and and i uh I, i absolutely can't do that but i'm actually thinking of skipping ahead of dark souls 2 and going straight to three because I've heard it has a lot of tie-ins to Dark Souls one, it and it is a lot of people's favorite game in the series. Um, mm-hmm. uh, and, and as it has like a little bit more linearity than Dark Souls one, but better mm-hmm. boss design and yeah. people, and you can see the the sort of design concept through line from Dark Souls three to Elden Ring, which is again another game on my list eventually to play. But uh, I'm, 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 and I, I, I mean, I, I know I've heard a lot about Freed and the Slave Knight and uh, some big dragon fella. Are all, th- are all three of those uh, DLC bosses? Yes, they are. Okay, okay. So maybe, maybe it's not as daunting as, as I was fearing because I, you know, I, I get stuck into YouTube rabbit holes of these are the <laughs> best bosses in Dark Souls. These are the hardest bosses in Dark Souls, and I see all these Dark Souls three guys, and I'm like, oh boy, maybe, <laughs> maybe, maybe 2026. We'll see. <laughs> Uh, the Nameless King is the only, I think, super challenging base game boss. So yeah, yeah. that is. A oh, I know. I know a little bit of the lore about him because he you does do? tie to Dark Souls one. And <laughs> yeah, yeah, Souls lore is cool, but we would probably need an entire new podcast like channel just to <laughs> just to, just for that. And there are already thousands of them probably. But uh, yeah, I've only heard good things about Dark Souls three. People even recommended to me years ago that I play that one first um, if I were to get in the Souls series. But uh, it, it's on the list. I I impulse bought it with uh, uh when after playing Team and Souls two years ago. Uh, but I haven't regrettably I've not I haven't gotten to it yet. So uh, I I love Dark Souls three, but it's it's also probably my least favorite of the whole series. Um, I Ahead definitely head of two and Demon Souls. Yeah, so I I personally like a lot of what's going on in both 2 and Demon's Souls. Uh, The the only reason I say that about Dark Souls 3 
is just because it it offers the least new to me in terms of like the whole continuity of the series uh i i love how it plays into dark souls one's lore i think it's really successful at that i agree that it has probably the best boss gauntlet in the series uh unless you count sekiro um but as a whole just like the the movement through the world which is something that i i really love about the series and that that still makes dark souls one my favorite is just probably the the least satisfying in three like the zones aren't super memorable to me the world doesn't feel like as much of a a coherent interlocked place um and then the combat just feels like halfway between like dark souls and bloodborne in a way that that doesn't feel like completely holy either and that isn't quite as fleshed out as what would what it would become in elden ring either um at the same time i love playing the game i would happily play it again but to me it just had like the least of its own distinct identity in the series uh other than just having an amazing boss run and uh, uh zach you put dark souls 3 tenth on your list um neither kyle nor i have played it and alex you it was not on your list even though you have played it so it's but you're saying so many kind things about it all that's telling me is that uh yeah the ps4 is pretty great so Kyle, does this make you one percent closer to playing a Souls game? One percent, absolutely. Okay. More than that, t- tough to say. I'm pretty, I'm pretty chicken, to be honest. That's it's, it's a me problem. Uh, it took me a a decade or so to um, get over my Souls apprehension, but now, but now I'm, I'm already thinking about which one to play next. But uh, let's see what game we're going to talk about next. Um, I think you mentioned it earlier in this episode, Alex, that uh, your honorable mention game was one of the first games you got for the system. Uh, yeah, it sure was. Um, and that that would be The Witcher 3. Um, so it honestly blows my mind a little bit that, that The Witcher 3 isn't on our top 10. Um, and like that, that's totally fine. Like, like your, your guys' lists were great. Um, but it's just like this this is the defining PS4 game for me. Like this is the game that that like not not just like because I played it like first at the time, but like even to this day, like the kind of like technical feats and like aesthetic feats that The Witcher 3 was able to accomplish is just like defines like the PS4 for me in terms of like having these giant zones that like are like put together like a number of different like little locales without like any load times like the seamlessness of like moving through the witcher 3's world is just insanely cool uh, and and really blew my mind at the time and showed me like what this this console is capable of and i mean like we, we've talked like enough about like what makes the witcher 3 great i mean just like the internet as a whole uh like the side quests are amazing the main quests are amazing the character development is like super involving um like some of like the most memorable like relationships with npcs i've ever had in an rpg or with the witcher 3 uh combat isn't that great but uh you 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 work through it to like experience all the other magic that this game contains and the the fact that it mixes in like polish folklore into like its medieval politics and everything like as as somebody from a polish family like it really really hit the spot and like even brought me closer to my own culture in a way that I really appreciated. So, I mean, that this game is just just a masterpiece, uh, one of the most impressive RPGs I've ever played, and and a real like magical experience at the time that I first played it. Well, I don't know if this will make you feel better or not, Alex, but uh, Witcher Three did finish twelfth on our list, and we only are talking about the top eleven in the in the final ranking. So the, the so the Witcher Three is is the very definition of an almost ran. Um, I, I have played the very beginning of it. I I uh, I got it on sale a long time ago, yeah, and uh, it, like I, I didn't like how uh, Geralt's basic movements and basic combat actions felt. And if that and that's often a deal breaker for me. If like if the basics of moving and running around don't feel good, then what? Then I'll 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 hate this game too early. But I mean, it's gotten so much praise over the years from you and Zach and others that I I am tempted to give it another shot eventually. Uh, maybe for this podcast, maybe in maybe long after this podcast is over. But uh, so it's on my list to maybe play someday. But I'm I'm not there yet, unfortunately. But it 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 did get officially twelve based on our scoring system. I could see The Witcher Three being the most blowback. I know, like 
I know that no one on the internet ever expresses an opinion of their own and, and definitely doesn't seek out others to express those opinions. If someone were to do that, I can understand why The Witcher 3 not making our list would get sort of a lot of blowback. <laughs> well, the thing is, that the um, the PS4's list um, uh, catalog is so good and so broad that, I mean, listeners of this show are going to be disappointed because some, someone's favorite game of all time is going to be missing. and. Uh, and and I mean the, the Witcher three is and Hades and Dark Souls three. I'm sure some listeners each assumed that one that that any one of those was a given. But uh, I nah. think a game that might finish first on a lot of lists doesn't even place on our list. So that I, I, I won't that's say correct. Is, but, I I, um, I think I have an idea of what of um, what that might be. Um, but uh, oh, foreshadowing. Eh, not really. But uh, <laughs> <laughs> we, 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 I'll mention it at the end maybe. But uh. Uh, I mean, Zach, I know you have played Witcher three and even and even and have even uh, told me outside of recording uh, about maybe making it an episode in the future. Yeah. Um, so uh, I, I know that's a game that you love dearly and it finished ninth on your list. Yeah, I mean, it's it's I, I placed it without even having actually finished the game. I played it like 80 hours and I have not quite finished it. I always want to do a fresh playthrough, but uh, I don't have anything to add to what Alex said. Um, and I agree with you that the, the game doesn't feel great to play. And it's one of the only games I've ever played where i just turned the difficulty down immediately because i didn't want to engage with its systems because i thought its systems were boring but the storytelling is so strong that that overcomes it for me um so yeah um i agree with everything alex said uh kyle and neither you nor i put witcher 3 on our lists and i know i i, I uh, only played the very beginning of it have you um given the witcher 3 a chance yeah i did when it was uh when it was a huge thing um i know that that's um just kind of terrible description, bad radio. But uh, no, when when the Richer Three was was making, um, you know, big waves, I I, I hopped on one of them, and um, it's interesting. I really enjoy hearing uh, so many people different different takes on it. I don't remember uh, the the character moving or or the combat as being an issue, and and maybe that shows how how long ago that I played it. Um, but I do very much remember what Alex is saying. You know where you you would ride into. You know there's a fort that stands out where there's a rather portly um, lord there that I remember. There was just such an over the top interaction and in how either the way I chose to play it or the way it played out. I just remember being like, man, this game is different. Um, and uh, and I remember enjoying a lot of the the narrative elements, but then you know as you do, just kind of fell off it for for many other reasons. But um, but I can understand why it kind of has that reputation and. Uh, sort of like we're saying, it's definitely something that that I would go back to in a in an enhanced version type idea and and see if I could re re experience it in a different with 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 fresh eyes, right? With with a different perspective. I mean, I mean, I don't think I'll ever uh, play Cyberpunk, and I'm not that interested in Witcher games other than Witcher Three. But th- this is the CD Projekt Red game. I'll probably bite the bullet and play eventually, but I, I just can't say when that's going to be. But um, you know, speaking of Western RPG developers that have had some recent blockbusters uh kyle your last honorable mention or i should say your choice for our honorable mentions is uh from a developer that's made a bit uh a bit of a big deal of a game recently but let's talk about their ps4 offering first yeah uh before they were the Baldur's gate uh three studio larian had uh, a couple of uh, almost honestly bangers like uh, the the divinity original sin games are um Anybody who who likes console uh, CRPGs, anybody who uh, is you know uh, interested in sort of seeing some of Larian's earlier work, especially if they had a good experience with Baldur's Gate three, uh, I highly advise them to search out the Divinity, Divinity Original Sin games, uh, specifically the second one. Uh, kind of kind of offhand, we refer to it as DOS two, Divin- Divinity Original Sin two. Uh, isometric, isometric tactical RPG, just a really, really well crafted game. Like it's just hard uh, to find a system in that game. As sort of as Zach was alluding to, one that he didn't, you know, in a previous game, he didn't want to engage with them. It's hard for me to point to a system in Original Sin 2 that I didn't want to engage with. Um, uh, I forget off the top of my head. So let's see what what. Uh, episode we were talking about how you know I, I was kind of talking how much uh, i love team building and um that was the episode with david vink 
Yeah, shout out to David Mink. Uh, and so team building is something that I'm just really passionate about. And, and I've never kind of gone down the YouTube rabbit hole of different builds and characters and the way that they could fit into a four-person party like I did for Divinity Original Sin 2. There's just so much customization. There's so much uh, sort of fun and uh, and ways to, to pursue you know, separate plot points. Uh, it, it's just really, really rewarding experience uh, and something that I highly uh, encourage others if they haven't sought it out already. Uh, it's, um, it's, it's just really rewarding. I, I do believe I have this game on Steam from some ill-advised uh, impulse purchase years ago. But uh, I remember when this came out in, I think, 2017, um, it got a lot of positive buzz. And uh, it's the, I want to say the fifth Divinity game, because there's Divinity 1 and 2, then Divine Divinity, then Original Sin 1 and 2. And it sounds like Larian basically got better at making RPGs with each new major release. And Original Sin 2 is a a very, very beloved game. I remember hearing about it on podcasts when it was new, uh, about the character interactions, like, like, imagine the basics of having a water attack create water everywhere then electric then electrocuting it with a thunder spell or spell spilling oil everywhere and then setting it alight with a fire spell like imagine that kind of interaction but there are dozens of them and you can do them in single player or multiplayer very smoothly and that's the kind of gameplay wrinkle that makes this sound very very inter- uh, interest this game sound very very interesting to me mechanically but also you're telling me the quests and overall story are pretty great as well. And this is the studio that would go on to make Baldur's Gate 3 a uh, a, a mega blockbuster of an RPG um, in 2023. That just makes it more and more intriguing to me. I, again, I have not played a single Larian game ever, even though I own probably at least two of them. <laughs> Yeah, but, I would say definitely if somebody is playing is is you know kind of listening and they loved Baldur's Gate 3 and are like, you know, looking to go backwards kind of uh, actually off air we were talking about like the the Yakuza experience, right? Um but uh like so if you played Baldur's Gate 3 and now are discovering Larian Studios, there is a lot a lot of DNA uh from your quote unquote Baldur's Gate 3 experience in divinity original sin 2 there are a ton of similarities and it's really i, I would highly encourage it yeah so I, I have a copy of original sin 2 but have not played it uh alex or zach do either of you have more experience with this game than i i have more experience with boulder gate 3 by like an hour that's about it uh <laughs> these kinds of games overwhelm me and, and all their systems i don't understand them but i want to play them that's what i will say <laughs> my uh my strongest memory of playing Divinity Original Sin 2, and it's not even a single memory because I felt I feel like it happened every battle, is just everything being on fire. Just like having like the pyromancy like build like with the the, the oil that, that you were describing, Solosi, is just like that that was like ended up being every battle for me. It was just everything's on fire. Um which was fun because like it's just like, yeah, that's like the way like the systems can interact with this game and that's how I played Far Cry Three for the most part, <laughs> <laughs> and uh, and it, and it's really fun to experiment with like the different like ability synergies and things, and is a clear like stepping stone to what Larian was able to uh, manage with with Baldur's Gate Three, like have like slapping on like the entire D and D system on top of what they were already doing in, in Divinity Original Sin Two. Um, and I also really appreciated how I could play it couch co-op with a friend. I was doing that, uh, and, and it was like a really fun local co-op experience. Uh, that was also an RPG campaign, which is great. But uh, we also just kind of fell off the game, and um, like there wasn't any particular reason why, but I can speak for myself in terms of saying that like, the general like writing and like the the story stuff just never really clicked for me and it never really resonated in any way that was too interesting like there there was clearly like still like a sense of like choice and consequence that they they adapted into Baldur's Gate 3 that was already there but in terms of like the the actual like writing and like the tone which was like kind of like more like it was like silly like the the older Divinity games I think were like even more silly um, but they were also trying to get into like a bit more earnest, serious storytelling. In a, and so those two things, the way they were in, in DOS 2 at least, just 
didn't work too too well for me um so i I wasn't gripped too much by by the story and world but i do i did have a blast with the gameplay systems and i mean going to Baldur's gate 3 i just i fell in love with that game immediately and and that was basically just everything i liked about divinity original sin 2 uh ironed out and proved on and um Baldur's gate 3 rules yeah all right, so uh, I mean, we're only only more than thirty minutes in already, but we got through our honorable mentions. Great, <laughs> but uh, I think we should go move into the list proper now. Uh, again, um, we t- we each of us made an individual top ten, and we uh, compiled them with a scoring system and arrived at a ranked top eleven. Um, the Witcher three and Original Sin two were both almost on the list because they finished in a tie for twelfth. But uh, we're going to start with our official tie for tenth. Um, and, uh, Zach, I'd like you to go first because this game that finished 10th, um, you were the only one to vote on it, but it finished very high on your list at number three overall. So, uh, I, I mean, I don't want to put, I don't want to like spoil it exactly, but is this just about the one expansion or is it about almost the entirety of Final Fantasy 14? It is really legitimately about just the one expansion. Um, so uh, the answer <laughs> to the question people are asking is um, Final Fantasy XIV and Walker. Um, so I, we're, I don't think we've said this yet, but at some point, either before or after this podcast goes up, we're going to have an official like sort of site-wide um, vote on this. Um, and one of the rules I made for that was that like you couldn't just vote for Final Fantasy XIV. Because if I could vote for Final Fantasy XIV, it would be my number one. Easy. Um, so even just as an expansion, I think that it deserves number three and heck Shadowbringers would probably hit that list too. Um, I know some people are probably thinking like, I played it on PC. I didn't, I played it on PS4 and PS5, but <laughs> that's what I was thinking. I mean, I mean, yeah. I, 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 I know that several, um, uh, Final Fantasy 14 expansions qualify for my personal criteria, but because I played them on PC, I really yeah. can't think of them as PS4 games. And, and I don't sense. know, I don't know how they control on PS4 either. But if I if I had fully included FF14 on my list as as uh, as as you sort of um, hypothesized there, it probably would have been in my top three at least. Yeah, uh, I mean, I mean, it just Ed Walker itself. I'll just kind of stick my conversation to that, just because I could talk for for hours about this. But um, Final we Fantasy have. 14, <laughs> indeed, we have um, Final Fantasy 14. Ed Walker does such a remarkable job of taking um, 13, but really 10 years of storytelling and kind of wrapping it in a bow. And it is so hard, I think. And I, I, I think this more and more, uh, I just watched like the most recent episode of Doctor Who and I was like, man, you did not stick that landing. Um, where, where they stick the landing and they stick it, really, stick it really effectively in ways that are surprising, but in ways that make sense. Um, and, you know, just thinking about the way they refine the gameplay systems, I feel like Endwalker plays better than Shadowbringers. I don't have any previous experience before Shadowbringers, but I think that the gameplay is really at a high level um, where they're introducing more difficult stuff for people who want it, but it's also just great for people who want to play it a little more casually, like I mostly do. Um, and just the storytelling is so strong. Um, and it, it's unfair even I think to put Endwalker here because it's leaning on 10 years of storytelling, right? But the way that it it nails those final moments and the emo the, the emotional moments of Endwalker just like are unbelievable. Um and I hit some highs that other games on this list I think uh maybe just barely exceed. Um and yeah, uh, and Walker, I think, is is a masterful achievement in video games. And I understand why it finishes this low for lots of reasons, but um, it it was that high for me because I I just love it. Um, unfortunately, I have played I have not played End Walker. My uh, I, I know that you, you this is a point of frustration for you, Alex. I'm sorry for you, Zach, and I'm sorry. Uh, but I stopped playing Final Fantasy XIV partway through the Shadowbringers post game, so I'm I'm like right before End Walker. You but, stopped right around when I started, which is crazy because I've been yeah, playing for so long. <laughs> yeah, that, that is crazy. I, I stopped in. The, I, I think it was like uh late 2020 or early 2021 is when i stopped playing um because i I was just i i needed to quit cold turkey because i was playing ff14 way too much uh the first year or so of the pandemic but uh the fact that it pays off um almost a decade of storytelling with the heidelin zodiac uh uh story i know it's more complicated than that but uh and sticks the landing 
and gives us an NPC in Vanat that I've heard so much about. Oh, is that she's Vinat already is the best. Yeah, yeah, she's already one of the most beloved modern Final Fantasy characters. Um, all of that is so impressive to me that it, oh boy, it, 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 that game's calling to me, man. But it, <laughs> but it, it's hard to run a weekly podcast and play an MMO to the degree that I used to play FF14. But in um, in but the pandemic. Yeah, but, but uh, <laughs> oh boy, no amount of working from home would 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 could justify me <laughs> playing FF14 during work hours. But the. Uh, <laughs> But but I mean, FF14 is a super special game overall, and I really loved my time with it. I just can't comment about the specifics of Endwalker because I stopped playing in in uh what is it uh five point two, mm-hmm. yes. Yep. Yeah, yeah. I know you didn't get to five point three because right. Yeah, yeah. I I I, I know patch. about I know about <laughs> one of the boss fights in in five point three, and I have not gotten there. Yeah. yeah. But uh, Kyle, I know you've dabbled in FF14 a little bit, but um, uh, did you ever get all the way to Endwalker? Uh, no, I, that seems like a significant uh, ways away. I uh, My most recent adventure has me kind of barely dipping a toe into Heaven's Word. Oh, okay. Um, <laughs> but uh, Zach and I were discussing uh, sort of like the... the, the how, how, do, how do we say this, Zach? Um, the... The ending of A Realm Reborn, and <laughs> you could just, you could just say the arm. It's fine, everybody. Every, if you know, you know. The arm, yeah. If you know, the, you know. the, the dinner party, yeah. yeah. This this quite literally might be like the only time I've ever known, if I've known. Um, but uh, yeah, I I am definitely somewhere in in the gigantic middle area of Final Fantasy fourteen, both figuratively uh, and metaphorically. I I understand. And I'm completely drawn uh, to the the flame of uh, of the storytelling payoff, uh, and yet it it seems like an awful large commitment uh, to get there. Um, but I, I I'm I'm first of all completely sympathetic and and so joyful for everyone who has made it. Uh, I can't wait for them to experience Dawn Trail, because I know that so many of them have been waiting for it. Oh, yeah. That'll be out by the time this podcast drops. That's Hell right. yeah. Uh, and, uh, and, and, and I'm happy to, to share my own kind of small adventure with those that, that can look back and say, oh, yeah, I remember that part. That's fun. Uh, and so I'm just really grateful uh, for that part of the community as a whole. And, and I'm glad that, the, that that community places on our list, because it deserves to. All right, so uh, Alex, do you count yourself as part of that community? I mean, like, I- I'm pretty sure I've said this like every time Final Fantasy XIV <laughs> has come up that I've been on the show, but I am still just about to start Shadowbringers, <laughs> um, which <sighs> I'm sure I will have a great time with. But uh, yeah, I mean, like, writing on on games with an RPG fan, doing podcasts on Retro Encounter, and doing like a PhD where I have to like play certain kinds of games that aren't final fantasy 14 has just uh kept me away from Shadowbringers and endwalker but uh um final fantasy 14 colon endwalker finishes in a grand tie for 10th on our list with a different final fantasy game um and this is i I know i mentioned this a couple times this is a game that uh was almost 10th or 9th for me it was in that consideration but i uh, ended up not going there um, but it was quite high on your list, Kyle. Uh, you, this is your number three overall game. Let's talk about Final Fantasy VII Remake. Uh, yeah, I, I have to admit, I'm, I'm a victim of nostalgia almost always, and, and this one really hits home. Um, you know, we were just talking about Endwalker sticks to landing. It's difficult to express how fascinating it is that after quite literally years of rumors and advent children and just so many different you know whispers that that a game comes out and literally remakes itself uh in a way that that Final Fantasy 7 remake does and it's not a perfect game uh it is in some ways controversial for how it tried to remake some of uh the I don't know the spirits flying around if you want to call them that um but the way that it just completely uh humanizes and fleshes out the characters uh of Avalanche and the way that it um 
thrusts Mid, uh, Midgar into a starring role in a way that only, um, you know, some of those really cool locations can accept that role uh, is just, it, it's pretty impressive. And, and of course, it's, uh, it's no small feat that, that it manages to keep a lot of that Final Fantasy VII vibe going and, and, and even improve on some of it. So I just thought it, it was, it's such a significant game for me personally and, and for the system that it just deserves to be on that list. And, and I settled it with my number three. I, I mean, I remember when this game came out, I thought 2020 was so loaded. It only finished fourth on my like list of best RPGs of the year. I believe it. it came out just because it was, uh, um, I, because that was a, a stacked year, but, uh, but as an experience, it's, um, I, I think even if it's, um, your first final fantasy game, it's, it stands on its own pretty well. Like, like we talked about this in our FF seven rebirth episode, Zach, but, uh, I, these remakes really are for people that have played the original games. Mm -hmm. Um, but in, but at least in remakes case, I think it's, it's playable enough if you've never played final fantasy seven. And I, and at, at least one of my, um, friends from outside the world of podcasts and websites uh, played this without playing FF7 and really liked it. So um, it, 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 it does bring to life things about Midgar that I never even thought of when I played original FF7 uh, 25 plus years ago, like, um, like lighting and painting the bottom of the ceiling to have it look like a fake sky. And uh, and fleshing out like the suburbs of Midgar and the, and, and uh, it it made Midgar of 1997 seem so much bigger and fully realized and like uh, Kyle said, fleshing out characters like Biggs Biggs Wedge and Jesse and um and and making Walmart feel like feel more alive and there's a lot of just moment to moment really excellent fights and scenarios, especially the Andrea Rodea dance scene. Oh yes, which is. <laughs> Oh boy, that uh, <laughs> maybe that's if, if the whole game was as good at that scene, maybe it would be my number one overall. Which but, is oh boy, <laughs> yeah, it, it, it's it's like it's like that that rhythm mini game is better than the entirety of that Kingdom Hearts rhythm game that came out with a couple of years ago, uh, and, and sold for also sixty fact. bucks. But uh, but but yeah, uh, uh, FF Seven Remake is really special, and uh, and again, one of my uh, well, one of my best friends, Final Fantasy Seven, is his favorite game, and remake was like the only game he bought that year and he platinumed it and it's like this is all i've ever wanted uh um and so i know it, it rings true for people that love love ff7 i like ff7 a lot i like this game a lot but it didn't make my personal top 10 and it also came out in a very loaded year so it, it at least for my personal ranking exercise um ff7 remake had some things going against it but i think it is extremely good and a worthy part of an overall top 10 mm -hmm. I actually think that if I had voted it maybe six months ago, it actually might have cracked it. Um, but I think I, I like Rebirth uh, by a pretty significant margin more than I like Remake. Especially um, structurally, I, I think I like Rebirth right. more than Remake. Yeah. And so I think that that, to some degree, had some impact on the way I was thinking about it. But I, I agree with everything you're saying. Like I think that while I have some issues with the ending, which I will not relitigate, I think that the character work is insanely good like if, if i'm thinking about like jrpg like standard jrpg style character work this and rebirth i think are just nailing it um with just the quality of the writing the quality of the characterization um i think some western rpgs might eclipse it but i i can't think of many jrpgs that do better character work than this and that in and of itself i think is a triumph and it, and it takes like these like pixelated they're not pixelated you know blocky uh, uh character models where they were just the characterization was happening that way and they take it and they build these fully fleshed out people um i i think it's it's remarkable for that if nothing else and there's plenty of else going for it too so i think it's a great pick and i'm glad it's here yeah i also like like this game quite a bit and i had a great time with it i, I think like the opening chapters like one to three were like pure pure like magic just feeding my nostalgia in like the best possible ways of like bringing like things that were like familiar but defamiliarizing them and just like offering like a new experience out of that was just amazing especially chapter three where you kind of like get to feel like you're living in like sector seven um i thought like just the the way they managed that vibe was just absolutely amazing 
Um, also, just the the combat in the game is maybe my favorite in like maybe my favorite in any RPG, which which also makes me a little confused why it's not on my my list. But then like as the game goes on, it just kind of settles into like a very conventional flow. And while I love Midgar, it's one of my favorite settings in any game, and I, I just absolutely love the whole Midgar section of Final Fantasy VII, the original. Um, just the way it was stretched out, like, sometimes felt a little grating to me, um, especially in terms of, like, the, the dungeons just feeling like like you're, you're running through tunnels, you're running through, like, platforms in an industrial zone, like... All of that stuff didn't didn't hit too too well for me, but like as a whole, like I still really enjoyed the game and yeah, the the story stuff like you Zach, not not all of it worked for me, but um still like just just the fact that these these awesome characters were brought to to life in such a way, um, and the fact that the combat hits hits this hard um means it's like it is a great game. It's absolutely a great game. Yeah, again, I'm probably going to say this a thousand times this episode, but I mean, the fact that only one of us had this game in their top 10, but we're all saying such nice things about it, just gives you an idea for how strong the PS4's library is overall. But, uh, I mean, despite all those nice things we're saying, FF7 only finishes 10th on our list. Uh, ninth on our list is a game that, uh, if, if FF7 was sort of one of Kyle's specialty picks, this might be one of my specialty picks, um... Monster Hunter World finished number three overall on my list. And I, I, I know I've mentioned this multiple times on the podcast, but I have been playing Monster Hunter games since the PSP days. And but I took a long break from around, I don't know, 2011 to 2018 playing Monster Hunter games because I couldn't connect with the uh, the Wii or 3DS games um, as easily as the PSP games. But when World came out and I saw that presentation at E3 in uh in i think 2017 uh and that game came out and my old monster hunter crew from the psp uh ps3 ad hoc party bootleg online uh multiplayer days they all came back to play world and uh it is maybe the most fun i've had playing a ps4 game online uh monster hunter is broadly speaking on uh an a, a multiplayer co-op action game with a lot of rpg elements um and uh, you know huge div- diversity of weapons and monsters and locations uh and with the general conceit being you fight monsters you make equipment from the monster parts and then you fight stronger monsters but uh, monster hunter world um made parts of the monster hunter formula more accessible worldwide it had good online for maybe the first time ever <laughs> worldwide and uh is I think either Capcom's best selling game of all time or one of their very best. Um, it brought me back into Monster Hunter. I played that thing for at least 300 hours, probably more. I didn't even play uh, the expansion Iceborne all the way through. But uh, to me, it is one of the defen- definitive PS4 experiences. My first, my my very, very intense six months of playing that game in, uh, uh, in 2018. But uh I, I, uh, Kyle and Zach, I don't think you guys are Monster Hunter players. Um, Zach, I know you played a demo for Wilds pretty recently, and that I didn't made play it. I watched it. Oh, but, oh, you yeah. didn't. Oh, really? But, but, yeah. but it got, but it got you Monster Hunter curious. Oh, for sure. I, I mean, I, uh, <laughs> I, I already owned World mm-hmm. and Rise because I respect your opinion, and it seems like the sort of thing I would like. Um, and so, but like the Wilds, uh, demo that I watched was just absurd. Like the, like the. The way that you had so many different ways that you could engage with taking down a monster that you needed to engage with taking down a monster, it was insane. But I, I think that might be a wilds thing. Uh, but I will say that I started playing Rise like I don't know two weeks ago, um, and uh, there were so many systems at play that I got overwhelmed, and I'm like, I just need a tutorial from Solosi, and then like the new Elden Ring stuff came out, so I was like, I'll ask later. <laughs> uh, but as soon as I'm done with Dawn Trail, it is my intention to play Rise, so that's where I am. Yeah, Monster Hunter has always, always had an accessibility issue, and this is true for me and pr- and probably many others as well. The best way to play Monster Hunter is to have an experienced uh, veteran of the game with you to walk you through some of the early parts, and yeah. then and then you sort of find your play style and your preferred weapon, and uh, and set some individual goals, and then you're off to the races. 
That but, sounds good. <laughs> and and Solo Monster Hunter is most of the time fine, but gets pretty awful in my opinion in the in late game hunts. But Monster Hunter multiplayer is just like is just some of the most fun I ever have playing video games. And it, it's that multiplayer experience of either popping online and helping random people that put up signal flares asking for assistance or making a party with my friends and each of us taking turns picking what to hunt based on what uh, things we're trying to craft or uh, or getting a, uh, a a major end game goal like trying to uh, hunt Fatalis or Elatrion or whatever. Um, uh, I think Ruin or Ner- Nergigante and those two others are sort of like the end game, end game of Monster Hunter World. Maybe Safi Jiva as well. I know those words sound like nonsense if you don't know what Monster <laughs> Hunter is. Um, but it, it's it, 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 it's so dense, but so satisfying. And I know you, you've probably heard me say this in podcasts many times. Whenever I play a Souls game, I'm like, oh, this is Monster Hunter canned animations and roll timing combat. So I've always and that's part that's of why exactly why I want to play Monster Hunter. <laughs> and, that's, and that's why I've always found um, the walk ups and environments harder in Souls games than bosses themselves, because my Monster Hunter instincts kick in and I usually do fine. <laughs> I, I, I think I beat all of the DLC bosses in Dark Souls one on the first attempt because it's like, oh, this is the rolling and guarding is actually better here than in that the, is than extremely in the, impressive against mana. <laughs> well, it. it it I, I i had a great shield but <laughs> but uh, but i um and and it was not easy but uh yeah yeah monster hunter world like made made me better at action rpgs and is a multiplayer experience especially that i treasure so much and i love the setting and monsters in it so much that it's one of my favorite series ever and this was the game that got me back into the series so i i view it uh, i i rate it so highly personally and I even think Rise might be better in terms of monster variety, but not as good in terms of uh, some other Monster Hunter trappings. I, that's a whole other discussion. But um, Alex, you also had Monster Hunter World on your list, but a little bit further down than I did. Um, how, how do your feelings of, about Monster Hunter jive? Uh, yeah, I, I love Monster Hunter. Um, I, I remember being like really interested in it, even just hearing about like Freedom Unite 2 on PSP and then the the first one I actually tried was Monster Hunter Try on Wii, which I, I picked up used for like super cheap because it wasn't like a super popular game out in the West. Um, uh, Freedom, but... Freedom Unite is the expansion to Freedom 2. And uh, uh, Freedom 2 was my first Monster Hunter game. Um, and I was uh, like really excited about Unite when it came out. But Monster Hunter Try, I felt, oh man, I, I, be, there's only like 20 monsters in that game. I, yeah. I, I I did not enjoy try. That was part of why I fell off. But uh, but Freedom Unite's my jam. We can we can talk about some Freedom Unite later if you want. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Down. Um. But yeah, try like I I did ultimately like bounce off because I, I think I was just too young and too uninterested in like difficult games at the time to like really like work my way through everything. Um. But yeah, like you were saying, like yeah, when when I really was able to get into the series was on on 3DS with like For You and Generations because. I had someone who was really into Monster Hunter, a friend uh, who kind of just showed me like, hey, here's some like basic like armors you can go for early game. And uh, here's like generally like what you want to take on every hunt. And even just having like that entry point, especially in those earlier games when all that crap was like way more obtuse, uh, really helped me just like focus on like getting to learn like weapons, like the weapons I liked and really like falling into that rabbit hole of like learning like what what weapon like i most like identify with and like mastering it and like that sense of like progression that um i always compare to like fighting games was just like so rewarding so awesome and and i was like in love with the series slowly enough um and then world is just like was even more of a revelation because i always like appreciated kind of like the simulation-y elements that the earlier monster hunter games had in terms of like trying to almost like present like a a real like ecosystem with each area and that was just taken to such a more like authentic extreme and world um that still makes it just like my favorite monster hunter uh even over rise uh because i just like hanging out in those spaces and seeing like the monsters interact with each other and things like that and it seems like wilds is going to lean even more heavily into that so i'm i'm beyond hype for wilds but yeah, World is is such a special game. It feels so nice mechanically, especially like the great sword felt like the changes they made to it just made it like 
my favorite weapon in that game. But yeah, I could go on about about Monster Hunter, but Worlds was just like, in terms of like bringing that like environmental representation uh, to another level, just really stuck with me, and I I spent so so much time with that game. Well, um, uh, backing up a little bit uh, on Monster Hunter as a larger franchise, there's always been sort of two Monster Hunter teams. Uh, the, the 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 personnel overlaps a lot, but uh, for many many years, or well, and still continuing probably, like uh, gener- each generation of Monster Hunter games had sort of two games: the console one and the handheld one, which is a little misleading because four and generations were both handheld. And uh, but uh, but there's sort of the, the the design philosophies have been on this these sort of parallel tracks. And and Rise came from the Generations team, while World came from the Monster Hunter Four team, and Wilds is the Fort is the uh, World team again. So uh, um, again, I think it's because of the development philosophies of these two halves of the studio. But World really does value the living, breathing ecosystem and the thriving community, and the sort of the uh, being closer to a real world ecology of dinosaurs and wyverns than the what generations and rise did which is throwing a lot of very fantastical monsters on uh on into the game at once but i i I think that's a long-winded way of saying that i think you're right wilds is going to feel more like the living breathing world of world than rise does and it depends on sort of what you value in a monster hunter game which sort of track you like better but I like the dogs and the bugs too much in Rise, so I, I think I pre- I might prefer Rise to World. But that is a very very difficult conversation for or thought exercise for me to do. And uh, really, any the the best Monster Hunter game to start with is the most recent one you have the system for, and uh, especially if you have a veteran to guide you a little bit, because they're all good and they're going to have a thriving community if it's, if it's at least somewhat recent. But maybe don't try to play the psp ones on ps3 online anymore that probably won't work no but you know um starting a, talking about games that had a presence on the ps3 but have grown and evolved beyond that um I, i'm just gonna uh get it out there right immediately kyle this this next game on our list <laughs> eighth number eighth overall yeah. is your number one ps4 rpg it is and um, it's a game that's part of a very long series that I've played a couple games in, but not this one. So uh, let's talk about Assassin's Creed, specifically your favorite Assassin's Creed. Uh, yeah, Assassin's Creed Odyssey. <clears throat> excuse me. Assassin's Creed Odyssey was my uh, number one choice, and uh, it's 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 subjective, like all lists are. Um, but this one hits me on on several different levels. Um, so I was a history major and, and have long been fascinated by ancient Greece. And this makes me think about earlier when Alex is talking about how um, his connection to Polish folklore uh, made him, you know, really drew him towards uh, his, his, his honorable mention game and it resonated with him on a different level. And so my fascination with ancient Greece and, and my, uh, you know, essentially undergraduate study of part of it um, is, for sure to blame for some of uh, why I think of this game so highly. It is for sure to blame why uh, I I am so drawn uh, to Assassin's Creed Odyssey, why I dumped, you know, more than 100 hours into it, while it's why I, you know, did every side quest and, and found every nook and cranny, and it's... Uh, and yet you didn't rank Hades on your list at all. Yeah, I was waiting for that. I was mm-hmm. waiting for that. Uh, yeah. it's, it's a bit of a roguelite thing, to be honest, um, which is why I used it more for education than anything. Uh, but like to, to be able to, you know, sort of walk, talk and act in a, in a living, thriving, you know, Peloponnesian war, uh, war torn world is, was quite literally a dream come true, I think f- for a part of me. And so, um, while all rankings are subjective, this one, um, is uh it ended up not surprising me when i ended up having it first uh assassin's creed itself is is not really thought of as an rpg although they've moved that way since origins uh odyssey does a better job and then um it kind of just continues to try to grow from there uh among the things that i find most impressive especially in retrospect uh is 
Uh, I really in, enjoy the, the the characters like we've been talking about. Specifically, the uh, the female lead Cassandra is a really awesome character. Uh, we did uh, Steph actually wrote uh, a blurb about her when we did a, a feature a couple years ago about femme power up uh, and 48 amazing women in RPGs, and so she detailed Cassandra. Uh, and shout out to her voice actor. I think it's pronounced uh, Melisanthe Mahout. I hope I'm not butchering that too much. Um, but she just does such a great job, uh, Cassandra, the character of of just being um, being the center of attention, being tough, being funny, being courageous, uh, being human, and uh, and then the threads all kind of start to pull from there. Uh, like I said, I, I think for a long time we didn't think of Assassin's Creed as an RPG, and and for for good reason. Um, but there's just so much content here. Uh, the storytelling's it's good, not great, but I mean there's a there's a personal sort of lost family history uh, that that tugs on the heartstrings. Um, there's a pretty uh, significant death of a minor character um, that you know, perhaps because of my occupation kind of hit me harder and, and really caused me to be more reflective. Um, there's, you know, you, you get your crew, you get your boat, you get to sail around uh, with with your people. And it's just, every time I turned around, there was something more rewarding. Uh, I loved the stealth builds, but you can have a variety of different, um, you know, sort of builds you can respect whenever. Um, uh, the cultist hit list for some reason was like really thought something I thought was interesting. You know, it's kind of like a pyramid scheme where you have to work your way up. Uh, and it's not original, but just the way that they kind of wove it in to this, to the story and to the plot and into, and you know, uh, your gear set. Uh, I just thought that Assassin's Creed Odyssey just does a lot of things that an open RPG, an open world RPG, you know, sort of should do well. It kind of nailed them for me. And so that's why I ended up ranking it so high. Now, um, listeners might already be a little upset with us for having Assassin's Creed on the list of RPGs at all. And to that, I my response is, well, you haven't played Assassin's Creed recently, have you? <laughs> because um, starting with Assassin's Creed Origin, um, they really have been single character RPGs, uh, the single character open world RPGs, because there is um, uh, a lot of skill building and and uh, equipment tinkering and. There, I think there really is a divide. Like before uh, Origin, these were um, character action games, and from mm -hmm. Origin onward, these are um, action RPGs. And Assassin's Creed Odyssey, like I'm, I'm, I'm worried that this is a, uh, a continuing trend for Ubisoft because each of them, of them, um, since Odyssey, maybe Origin as well, but Odyssey more so. These are just enormous games. Like I've heard of people playing um uh playing Valhalla the one after Odyssey for like for like over 200 hours. Like yep. it, it, I'm I'm almost worried they're too dense with content, which makes me less likely to play them even though I mm. own a cup I I own a couple of Assassin's Creed games, but I um the last one I played uh in earnest for more than an hour or so was Brotherhood. And I and I thought 2 and Brotherhood were both really really good. But I haven't um gotten into the RPG ones yet in part because they're dauntingly large, but I also am a hypocrite because I mentioned not 10 minutes ago <laughs> that, I, that I played Monster Hunter World for 300 hours in 2018. So, yeah, I'm, I am interested in Odyssey and the other RPG Assassin's Creeds, but uh, I don't know when that'll happen for me. Um, but it's I, I mean, there's been a lot of praise for these recent ones, including like I, I like Caitlin and Steph are maybe the two biggest fans of Odyssey on the on RPG fan staff other than you Kyle but uh yeah regrettably I haven't played in Assassin's Creed in earnest since uh the, um since 2012 or so I mean there's good reason like kind of not to but uh like I said I, I just think at the end of the day for me it came down to um everything that an open world RPG does well Assassin's Creed Odyssey does well uh and uh I again I can understand why some you know would disagree would be reticent to that but that's sort of you know where I landed in um, and especially if anybody has like any affinity for, for ancient Greece, uh, I would encourage them to check it out. Uh, Zach or Alex, do we have any uh, other Assassin's Creed Odyssey players in the house? We do not, at least not for me. 
No, I, I still haven't checked out the the RPG Assassin's Creed trilogy. Um, I've been meaning to check out Origins specifically because, honestly, just because it's like the shortest one of them all. So I, I am kind of curious to see how they like Witcher threeified Assassin's Creed because that's my understanding of of this trilogy is basically that they they incorporated the Witcher three's DNA into the the Assassin's Creed universe. I can um, see that. Which sounds cool. Uh, I mean, I love The Witcher 3, so if, like, this offers, like, a Witcher 3-type experience in just, like, ancient settings, like, that's kind of cool. Um, so I will definitely check out uh, Origins sometime soon, just out of curiosity. But, uh, yeah, I, I, I'm, I'm interested to see what, what they've done with these. I think it's possible, Alex, that the, the sort of more, um, I, I don't know how to, how to phrase it in my head, uh, the action combat, I guess, um, you know, when you're not being stealth, uh, would draw perhaps a lot of comparisons to The Witcher. Mm. It would be my one of my first instincts. There's a is lot it... of sort of like parry and encounter type of, of Witcher mechanics in there, from what I remember. Okay. Is it similar in like kind of like world design and quest design to, to Witcher 3 as well? Or does it does it? You might have to help guide me on, on that one, yeah. Oh, okay, true. I mean, we don't have to get into that now, but uh, Fair maybe, enough. maybe we'll talk talk off air a bit. Yeah, good call. <laughs> well, you know, we just had the Canadian half of our panel discuss a <laughs> a, uh, a Canada developed game, and uh, but there's another ca uh, Canada developed game on our top ten list. So let's move into the second half of our Canadian contingent of the top ten. Um, Dragon Age Inquisition. Um, came out in 2014, and we somewhat recently had a, a uh, release date confirmed on its uh, on its true sequel, Dragon Age: The Veil Guard. Uh, Dragon Age: Inquisition is basically DA3, Veil Guard is basically DA4, uh, and it's 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 a bit of a uh, a bit of a gap there, ten years in between Inquisition and Veil Guard. But we're going to stay firmly in the past for now and talk about Dragon Age: Inquisition. Uh, this game was on my list and Kyle's list. Uh, I, I really, really enjoy Dragon Age. I've been playing them since around 2010. We talked about them in uh, the other, the older Dragon Age games in some podcasts late last year and early this year, uh, including you, Kyle. I'm sorry, you, Alex, were on those, uh, those panels with me. And uh, Inquisition, it's a pretty brilliant continuation of the lore and characters and story through lines of those games. But maybe most obviously, this is a game that came out three years after Skyrim did. And everything about Dragon Age, from the, the good character writing and the, uh, and the politics of the world, are, are still there. But it's uh, set in um, semi-contained open-world zones. Not unlike other, uh, a couple other games on this list. But it, it's very, very clear that Bioware had some order from EA executives to make us a new Skyrim. Or make us our make us our own Skyrim, and I, I say that with some some consternation. But ultimately, I was I think the game's excellent. Again, it's in my top ten. Um, the the character banter is good. The the team building is really good. The uh, individual class trees are fun to explore. Um, the, all of the you get a lot of efficacy as a main character in in your Inquisitor that can be that uh, uh has a huge variety of voices and races and uh, and builds to, that you can. Uh, engage with this is uh, and and again the the classic age of Bioware, which I think sort of firmly ends with Inquisition. Like I, I would say that sort of like uh, like 2003 to 2014 or so is uh, is is really going at all cylinders here. And uh, it, it, this is not my favorite um, Bioware game, and maybe not even my favorite Dragon Age game, but Inquisition is very very strong, and I'm going to be replaying it very soon because we're doing um two episodes on dragon age inquisition uh next month so and i'm and i'm really looking forward to getting that to that soon but uh before i do that i have some other uh podcast games to finish uh but uh kyle um i had this eighth on my list and this was second overall on your list so uh you maybe have some even more uh positive feelings for this game than i do uh let's talk about dai a bit yeah, it's cool. You know, between Zach and and Alex, you and I, we've we've kind of hit Dragon Age uh, news uh, pretty heavy. The four of us in the last uh, ten days or two weeks. Um, I know Zach had you know like the big preview feature for the Veil Guard, and 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 I was working hard on the the news day that everything announced. 
Uh, Inquisition, um, I, I said off air, but Inquisition is the, the the game that I bought a PS4 for. So, um, you know, to have it on my top PS4 RPG seems seems pretty fitting. Um, like you say, it, it's uh, it's Bioware almost almost at its best, or at least under under orders to be their best. Uh, the banter party, the party banter you mentioned, uh, the character builds you mentioned, but if it's not the best Dragon Age game, it might be the most complete. Um, I don't I don't know. I haven't had enough time, maybe off the top of my head, to flesh out that take. Uh, but I just really appreciate Inquisition for all the things that it that it wanted to do, that it tried to do, and then it it looked to succeed in. Um, it's like it's just really it does a really good job of trying to drag Origins and and two, you know, through the Dragon Age keep and and try to get all those decisions from before. Um, in a way that's a lot messier than Mass Effect, uh, which is sort of its like, you know, sort of sister franchise. Uh, but just the way that the Dragon Age universe builds, uh, both towards Inquisition and within it, I think uh, is its own reward and and had me, you know, it was a no doubter for my my top ten list. Yeah, man, I I still remember one sort of key decision point in that game where I had to choose between um two. Uh, mm-hmm. previous game characters that I really, really love a lot. Uh-huh. Uh, and, uh, and also, like, I don't think this constitutes a spoiler. Around the middle of the game, there's a, uh, you sort of, like, bring a large international conflict to an end through a diplomacy-only sort of, uh, mm-hmm. uh, like, not exactly a dinner party, but, like, a diplomacy-only, dialogue-only segment mm-hmm. that can go a, a, a great number of different ways. And I think that things like that and um, what they do with specific characters, especially one character that I'm 95% sure is the main villain of Veilguard. <laughs> um, and and uh, like, like th- this um, takes Dragon Age concepts and characters to, uh, to I don't want to say new heights exactly, but but to a two points that feel so satisfying. Um, that I, I'm sort of impressed they were able to pull it off, and then a little bit shocked that it took them uh, more more than ten years to give us a, a sequel to it. Because I, I don't think this was a failure game. It's just that um, Bioware's had a very very rough time in the intervening ten years, where uh, Mass Effect Legendary Edition was a big success, but uh, um, Andromeda and uh, why can't I think of it there? Um, Anthem. Yeah, Andromeda and Anthem were not big successes. So I'm I, I'm sure that Bioware and EA have a lot riding on the Veil Guard, but I can't help but be excited for it because I um and I because the Inquisition was so good, even though I'm sure most of the writers of Inquisition aren't with uh, Bioware anymore. I mean this this world is so fun and these characters are so good that I I want to see how it continues. Yeah, and and I, I guess I just want to just go one back to one one or more of the characters. Um, it was at least in my memory, it was a big deal that that uh, one of the, you know, core members of your entourage was sort of openly gay. Uh, and, you know, Dragon oh, Age right, is sort of yeah. like the, the gay series, uh, which is not um, a slander at all. And it is, it is sort of part of why I love the series, because it has been uh, so willing to open its arms and, and wrap, even in a dark fantasy setting, kind of wrap itself around uh, the the pride based community, especially here in the month of June when we're recording this. So uh, I just think that not only is this universe and its characters uh, so well done, but they've, they've just done a really good job of kind of sticking to what they want to be and, and to some of their values and, and holding fast to those. So I, I really appreciate that about the, the series in general. Yeah. Inquisition gives you a gay party member, a lesbian party member, an openly bi party member, and an important NPC that's trans. So uh, and for for being a 2014 RPG doing that a a triple A budget 2014 RPG doing that really just is you know bullet points in that oh yeah uh BioWare has been progressive all along. Yeah, it's a <laughs> sorry, big deal. sorry haters. Uh <laughs> but you, you know um I, I, Zach and Alex I, I I know Alex you haven't played Inquisition yet cuz we've we've talked uh, a little bit on other podcasts about your background with uh, Dragon Age and um Zach oh, I, I started it. <laughs> <laughs> 
Oh, you have. All right. So what are your early impressions? Uh, maybe spoilers for a podcast six weeks from now. Uh, really positive. Um, I am like about 20 hours in and oh. think it, it might already be the best Dragon Age game. Like I, I loved Origins, but it was still very much working within that Bioware formula. And Inquisition has absolutely like loosened itself from that formula in a way oh, that it's, feels it's really so, fresh. It's so breakable. I mean, did you have you did you find the battlefield zone yet? Uh, the battlefield zone. I'm not sure about that. This game gets so wild with the paths you can you can take. I've ended the war before finding the battlefield zone, and me exploring the battlefield zone zone was telling both sides that the war was over. <laughs> very nice yeah that, cause, that, that's uh, very funny to me i'm sorry maybe my memory from 10 years ago is a little bit cloudy but uh yeah th th this game lets you break storytelling rules a lot and it's in a, in a fun way yeah and it's got like the same like weight to its choices that origins had the same like kind of interesting dynamic of putting you in like a leadership position over like a bunch of party members but having like like the way you role play that position kind of informed by like your your race and your class and like your whole like understanding of how those things like work within the Dragon Age universe. Like I, I absolutely love that stuff and I'm getting a lot out of it with Inquisition. And that's also just to say like the first time I tried to play Inquisition was uh, I bought it on like PS3 and like I was told that like you can play it as like a standalone. It's not like tied to its uh first two games and I, I think that's completely nonsense like i was so much more engrossed in what was going on in this game because i had played the first two games at this point like just right off the bat because like i had an understanding of that history a whole understanding of how it's like cultures worked and um the i will say like the side quests suck like they're they're really terribly designed and not interesting at all uh, but you can so honestly, fetch quests. Oh, you can ignore word. them completely, like at least on normal mode, like you don't need that extra experience. So I never felt uh, like don't in stay like, in the hinterlands too long. For, for the love <laughs> of I've also I got that PSA as well. And, yeah, uh, that was that was uh, a great, great don't idea. do what I did. <laughs> Um, there's a <laughs> there is a social media push going around, especially with the veil guard stuff that was like uh what what did it say something like one hundred percenting the hinterlands is now a uh recognized uh you know disability or something like that like just uh man poor us I, yeah, w when i start when I start up this game again probably in a week or so i am i am going to race through the hinterlands instead of take my time but uh, but yeah, for an open world RPG with so many things uh, behind it and that it's balancing it, I think Inquisition really is special. I, I hope you continue to enjoy it, Alex. I think I will. Uh, but Zach, I, I know we've we've talked about the the um, Bioware games off air before. Um, you haven't yeah. played. Yeah, uh, I don't believe you've played this one. I haven't played any of them, so that's <laughs> correct. Well, I still old Republic, but does that count? It was a long time ago. It, it counts as Bioware, but it does not count as Dragon Age, I'm afraid. No, indeed. Um, but I did see the first full hour of the Veil Guard, and it made me curious enough to want to go back and play them because I thought that what I was seeing, and I know it's controversial, <laughs> that first hour of the Veil Guard, but... Um, <sighs> I mean, it is to a lot of people, but uh, <laughs> I'm not sure. I, I don't have the experience to know why. I was like, hey, Solosi, please tell me everything yeah. about Inquisition so that I could understand how to write about it. <laughs> um, but yeah, I'm curious, but, you know, it's just, you know, it's on the list. Uh, I know, Solosi, that we're taking too long, so I, I just want to maybe throw one more thing in. Anybody who likes to play a mage, like any anybody who prefers magical characters, to guide a mage through the Dragon Age universe I think is maybe an unrivaled experience for you because they are so controversial and it's so interesting. Oh, elf mage all the way for inquisition. That's what I'm playing. And mm. Oh my God, has it been interesting? Yeah. Yeah. I, I don't doubt it. Um, but I'm, 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 I'm not sure how I'm going to approach fail guard with classes, but I think I'm going to do inquisition as a warrior because I've done rogue and mage in the in this current playthrough but uh, we, we really need to move on because this episode might might break the two and a half hour mark uh and let's go to, go to a game that i think um all of us have maybe a little bit more experience with than uh than dragon age um yakuza zero 
appears in the top five of both Alex and I. And I know it's not your favorite Yakuza game, Zach, but you've uh, played Zero as well. Um, I, I don't need to talk wax about this too much <laughs> because, I mean, we recorded two whole podcasts about it in 2020. This was the game that got me into the Yakuza series after reading about it and hearing about it on podcasts for several years. Um, the Yakuza games became my sort of pandemic companions. I played basically three or, or so a year for four straight years <laughs> and now i'm completely caught up on the series um it's uh almost unrivaled as sort of human dramas uh video games set in the real world with uh without science fiction or fantastical elements to a degree i mean there's orbital lasers in some of them but uh and on top of these like extremely dramatic exciting crime stories you have different storytelling tones that are so insane they are could equally be in like a 1970s battle without honor humanity japanese yakuza movie or the most bat crap crazy anime from 1999 <laughs> that you ever heard of and uh and, and balancing the comedy and the drama and the absurdity um in the Yakuza games are maybe set to a peak in Yakuza zero. It's set in a very historically interesting part in Japanese history in the 1980s when they were the second largest economy in the world behind the, behind the United States. Um, uh, excess and money are, uh, are flowing wildly. And, um, and, and, and it's for a game to have so much interesting, uh, character drama also be basically set centered on real estate is, uh, is is so fascinating and um and and also this is the game that is it's i mean for if you're a little bit familiar with yakuza but haven't played yakuza zero this is the majima game because oh, yeah. um, majima <laughs> is a, a minor antagonist um from the from the first uh five yakuza games because zero is uh was released between uh five and six um that became a fan favorite and is not in uh, Yakuza four or five for very long, but in uh, Yakuza zero, he's the co-protagonist where it's about um, Kiryu as a young gangster in Tokyo and Majima as a young gangster, mostly in Osaka going through personal struggles and finding their places within the Tojo clan. And, and, but, and, but never meeting in Yakuza zero, this is about their separate struggles. You meet characters that, uh, are important figures in later Yakuza games and you see their younger selves, perhaps knowing what happens to them, perhaps not. Uh, but it, it basically gives you such strong feelings about these characters and that, that are even better if you understand what happens to them later, that uh, it's, it's such a powerful experience to me. And, but I haven't even mentioned gameplay. There, each character has four fighting styles. The variety of mini games and side content is in, incredible. Um, the side story writing is mostly very good, but sometimes like uh, jaw droppingly crazy with the places it goes um, like like you, have, you infiltrate a cult and have to learn their dance. You have to uh, um, help a uh, uh, a dominatrix that lacks confidence. <laughs> and when you help the dominatrix, one of her clients joins your real estate company as a manager. <laughs> uh, you you end up you end up bowling uh, to try to save the life of a chicken. <laughs> that might that, that that might become someone's dinner if you lose. Uh, the it, it is so crazy and so fun. But the if you ignore the crazy, then it's a really compelling crime drama. That it, it's one of the total package action RPGs of the 2010s. And again, it, it kicked off my like a dragon slash yakuza obsession that continues to this day. I I don't know if I would be more excited for any video game uh, announcement right now than the next Ryu Gagotoku studio game. Like it would take something at the level of Capcom reviving Mega Man X or Chrono Trigger three to, to make me more excited than like a dragon nine. Mm -hmm. But uh, yeah, I think that anyone that likes action RPGs or open world games needs to give Yakuza zero a shot. Uh, and then Zach, I know it's not your favorite, like a dragon game, but it is oh, my favorite. So I'm going to, so Oh, oh, really? Because you you said some rude things about Yakuza Zero on a different podcast a few I, years ago. I didn't say anything rude. I said it wasn't essential, and I stand by it. But mm. <laughs> <laughs> uh, there's a difference. Um, and at the time, I hadn't actually finished it, but I have now. Um, and I I still 
don't th- it didn't place on my list uh but um i i do think that yakuza zero for me like yakuza zero is so carried by the story of majima um and the strength of the story of majima um and i think that the way that the themes play back and forth between kiryu and majima's stories are really fascinating i think the ending is really emotional and you know for for me like the first one i played was yakuza 7 um and so i didn't know much about majima like a lot of people probably did when they played zero and i think that just to see his growth throughout that and how surprising it is um that it it makes sense that he is who he becomes in kawami um, i think is just like remarkable character writing and character growth and i think that if for nothing else and I, i agree with everything else you said but if for nothing else, the growth of Majima is just remarkable storytelling. And I think it's really strong along with everything else you said. And uh, uh, one thing that is, uh, I, I don't think it's, I don't think any of it counts as a spoiler. Um, Kazuhiro Nakaya is the voice actor that plays Ichiban in, uh, in Like a Dragon 7 and 8. Um, <laughs> uh, but he is the, um, he is, many years ago, he was the voice of Nishikiyama, the main villain of Yakuza 1. And Nishikiyama is maybe the best side character in Yakuza Zero. Like there, he uh, and uh, um, Nakaya has so many emotional dialogue scenes as Nishikiyama that uh, I, th- th- uh, there's no official yeah. oral oral history that establishes this. But the studio, we fans believe the studio liked working with him so much that they they they, they made they designed Ichiban with the plan to have Nakaya voice him from the beginning. Um. But that's enough for me. Uh, Alex, you also had Yakuza 0 quite high on your list. Um, so uh, you definitely have some positive feelings about it. Uh, let's talk about them. Uh, I mean, like, you guys have touched on so much of what I, I love about the series and, and this game in particular already. So I don't have too much to add um, other than to say, like, this is my favorite Yakuza, one of my favorite games ever, along with everything I put above it. Um, and, and yeah, just on, on the point of that, like, that that tone it manages between like silly irreverence and like like authentic like on a sometimes even like heart wrenching melodrama is like so impressive and it's like something that feels like so specific to like what video games can manage with their with their storytelling uh, and their tones uh, that like the only other franchises that manage that balance in such a such a seamless perfect way are like Metal Gear Solid and and Mother. And both of those series are like two of the other best series of games I've ever played. So, I mean, uh, it's also like Yakuza 0, it's like so easy to recommend to people because unlike the rest of the series, like there's none of like the baggage of continuity. Like you mentioned, like it's it's great to like pick up on the uh, how like the characters will develop in the future if you played those games. But you can also just jump into Yakuza 0 completely fresh and um which is how i did it yeah yeah and like totally like gel with the story and be able to follow everything that's going on and not have to do like any prior research like i had to do with yakuza 4 being my first yakuza game that was a tough one to get into first but um yeah i mean zero zero is like like near perfection to me I, i i love the game yeah zero also has very very smart reuse of assets maybe of any other game that i've ever played because it takes two of the maps from yakuza 5 but then 8 gives them an 80s makeover yeah. and and some and some characters are clearly reskins of older characters like when hai lee is obviously saijima and uh the character oda or i think his name's jun oda is uh um uh why can't i think of his name yakuza 4 boy uh yeah um akiyama akiyama yeah 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 um and, and like like jun oda is clearly a reskinned akiyama and uh and they do things that are they clearly were able to make this um just one year after like a dragon ishin because they reused so many assets from yakuza 5 well that you can that only the you know seasoned fans will see what see what's going on but it just makes it even more impressive to me as a as a now a a veteran fan, but I was not a veteran fan when I played this uh, four years ago. But uh, you know what? Um, I've had a pretty good record so far. I have uh, played every single game that we've discussed other than Assassin's Creed Odyssey. 
but now we're into the other game on the list that I have not played yet. Um, but uh, and but also we're in the point in the list starting with the Yakuza Zero. Every game in our top six has had uh, dedicated episodes of Retro Encounter. So if you say the PS4 isn't retro, then I disagree. Uh, yeah, we did two episodes on Disco Elysium last year, and I know everyone on that episode was really, really excited uh, about the storytelling present. And um, and Alex, uh, you were on those episodes. Uh, let's talk about Disco Elysium a bit. Yeah, sure. So um, Disco Elysium, uh, it is ostensibly like a, a classic CRPG kind of done in like that Infinity Engine perspective. Uh, clearly like drawing on like the aesthetics of like the original fallout baldur's gate and especially planescape torment being like a much more narrative and like dialogue driven experience with also like a unique presentation of its protagonist and like disco elysium just takes that even further and just been like okay what if we just like get rid of like the combat and like classic D D systems altogether and just replace it with a separate like RPG system that is much more philosophical, much more uh, kind of heady in terms of like how it fits into uh, the gameplay and the world and everything that this game manages to accomplish with uh, with its characterization and world building. And uh, yeah, that that it throws you into the the underwear of Harry Dubois, who's just uh, an amnesiac <laughs> protagonist, the like uh, any other good uh, video game protagonist um but he's just finished uh like a totally disastrous like alcohol and drug induced bender and that has been the the root cause of his amnesia so it's a very like silly premise in one way but like i mean like talking about yakuza managing like silliness and seriousness together <laughs> yeah. like disco elysium is another game that really accomplishes that feat um and so, yeah, you you are a total mess of a of a human. Uh, you get to spec into certain systems and stats at the beginning of the game, but instead of it being like strength, dexterity, intelligence, charisma, and all those classics, uh, you have things like, oh, are you gonna spec into your intelligence, which includes things like rhetoric or your conceptualization ability or your ability to be dramatic in certain situations. Or will you spec into like your hand-eye coordination, uh, and like your motorics and um, physical instrument is my favorite. Yeah, physical instrument for a, yeah that that whole section. Um, and so all these stats are essentially characters that uh, inform your gameplay experience, and your gameplay experience will be completely different depending on what stats you've spec most into, um, because not only are you conversing with uh, characters exterior to the world. Um, but at the same time, like these internal characters, these factors of your personality that are most prominent in your build, just insert themselves into conversation and kind of twist the way you see things uh, in a really fascinating way um, that makes no two playthroughs alike, as long as you're specking in different things. Yeah. Um, and so it's just, I've played the game twice. I got two completely different narrative experiences out of it. They were both like, absolutely profound um in a way that no other video game has managed um and so i mean on on that merit alone yeah disco elysium is, is something special i i don't mean to overstate uh because I, I agree with everything you said but i think if uh, for a video game to capture what it is to like the human experience at least my human experience not to say too much about how much of a mess i am but um <laughs> harry dubois is, is such a an interesting slate for us to deal with in the way that it uses all those different stats to get to the different elements of humanity that all of us have mm -hmm. um, and how sometimes uh, the decisions he makes, uh, you know, there's nothing he can do about it because he's made decisions before or whatever. And it, it just, the way it plays around with choice, the way it pl plays around with narrative ideas, um, not, not to even get into all the, you know, anti-capitalist or philosophical ideas that it's dealing with um, is amazing. And I think maybe the most important thing, not the most important thing, but one thing that people don't talk about a lot is Disco Elysium is the funniest game I've ever played. Yeah, um, true. By like a huge <laughs> margin. Um, it is hysterical, at least for my sense of humor, at least. Um, and 
early on I was playing it as like a chaos cop. Like I just wanted to see like the rudest, most ridiculous things all the time. But the game eventually convinced me to role play it a different way. And like the fact that the game convinced me to like stop like taking the piss and start dealing with things more profoundly and more sincerely, partially because of Kim. Like it was a true role playing experience. Um and I, I feel like I'm being hyperbolic here, but I Disco Elysium is a masterpiece. Uh, it's untouched in so many ways. Um, and I'm so glad it's on our list at all. Yeah, I mean, like, it just really points to the potential of, like, what if we, like, adapt, like, tabletop systems about things other than just, like, the classic Dungeons & Dragons things and had that inform, like, the way we interact with the world. And I think we're getting more games like that with, like, Citizen Sleeper and Pentiment. And I think there was, like, one or two other like dis like more explicit disco elysium clones that came out in the last year um and with, with with baldur's gate's success uh you're there's gonna be a lot more games with explicit dice rolls in it in the next five years i'm i'm qu quite certain of that yeah but and that that's the other thing like just the the gameplay of the dice rolls oh my god like some of my most like thrilling so much drama play moments were just <laughs> like like what in my last playthrough i had a, a three percent labeled impossible dice roll and i i hit it and it was a success and like like my heart dropped like it was it was some <laughs> of the most thrilling gameplay i've ever had and it was just because of like the story implications and like random chance like that, that my, that's something special my biggest devastation was failing a dice roll for kim that made me say something extremely rude to him. And I still remember <laughs> it to this day. Um, and it's like my biggest loss in an RPG of all time. What was your success rate? Oh, it was high. It was like 75% or something. Like I was, I was trying to be nice to this guy because who could not be nice to Kim. Um, and I ended up saying something like homophobic to him, if I'm not mistaken, it was horrible. Um, so yeah, just interesting the way the game works. Well, um, this game was not on my list or Kyle's list. I, I played the very beginning of Disco Elysium several years ago, or only maybe just a couple of years ago. I don't, I don't, time doesn't mean anything to me anymore. Um, but, uh, and, and I found it, um, fascinating, but confusing. I gave into despair and, and passed out on the spot because I lost an argument against a, uh, against a union boss, I think. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> um, Classic. but, but, uh, it, it's a very, very fascinating game for the, um, emotional and, uh, and political places that it goes. And it's also mechanically very fascinating for a game that has so many systems, but no systemic combat or action. Uh, I'm, I'm, I'm still interested to try it again, to try it someday, but there's also no danger of me ever running out of video games. Um, but Kyle, you didn't rank uh, Disco Elysium either. Have you at least tried it? No, but I, I do think that of the games we have left to discuss uh, that I have not played. So I've, I haven't played sort of, unfortunately, four of the five that we have left. This is the one I'm most interested in. And it is specifically because I've heard Alex talk about it on multiple podcasts. Uh, and I'm, I'm very, very interested in, in the whole concept of it. All right. Well, I mean, speaking of games that uh, Alex talked about, uh, the, the Disco Elysium was fifth on our overall list. So we're at number spot number four now. Um, this is Alex's number one game on our individual rankings. And it's a game that I played in one sitting uh, several years ago, I think in 2018, um, on a charity stream that ended up getting about uh, uh, $200 or so for DC Children's Hospitals. When RPG fan was doing a a a a, a a a a child's play charity stream around Halloween, but that that that's a story for another day. Um, Alex, let's talk about your favorite PS4 RPG. Yeah, for sure. I mean, like I might like Disco Elysium a little bit more than it, but my rationale was kind of like, oh, I'd rather play Disco Elysium on a PC for sure. Um, so that's why I ended up putting Undertale as my number one, which is uh, right up there with Disco Elysium in terms of like two of maybe my top five favorite games ever. Um, and Undertale is awesome. Uh, speaking of another, yet another game that kind of manages like really silly humor and uh, really dramatic uh, moments. Uh, Undertale is like full of like kind of emotions and um, like really well-written characters and just like provides like with very minimal graphical fidelity, like, 
a really like human like bonding experience with like the different monsters you meet throughout the game and and not only like the npcs that you actually have like cutscenes with and talk to but also the monsters you get to interact with in battles uh so long as you're not doing like a violent route you ha- kind of have to uh select the act command rather than the fight command and that kind of like defines like the two different extreme playthroughs you can do in the game so if you want to kill monsters as you would in any other rpg and get experience points or spoiler alert they're actually called execution points but you don't learn that until much later on um that you want to choose the the act command um which gives you a couple of different uh words that define like a specific like verb or way of interacting with a monster and you get like this dynamic like social experience with every like minor enemy you encounter and it kind of just flushes them out a little bit more uh and actually makes for some fun gameplay uh because even while you're not attacking you still have to do like uh a whole like defensive mechanic uh when enemies are are not quite like pacified yet uh not quite sure of like whether you're like a friend or a foe and so uh, it basically becomes a bullet hell game temporarily at that point and um it, it's a hell of a good one too um like you get to like you control a little heart around this little box and every enemy kind of has unique attacks that also personalize them a little bit um which really like gets taken to its best extreme in, in the game's amazing boss fights um so like in, on that note like the game is like really successful on both like a narrative and like mechanical level it's extremely tightly paced at like under 10 hours and depending on which route you choose whether to like be violent or uh more of a pacifist uh you get two completely different like experiences out of it like the the violent route of the game is like one of the most like dreadful horrifying things i've ever experienced in a in a video game and then the pacifist route is one of the most uplifting uh positive experiences i've ever had with the video game so the fact that both those things are are put into undertale with a lot of other variations possible by any sort of in between um it's it's honestly like like a like a miraculously designed game like it's 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 brilliant it's got amazing music on top of all that too so yeah love this game i i like undertale but it didn't write right in my top 10 um and probably because of how i experienced it i accidentally killed one enemy in the first dungeon before i really knew what the experience stuff worked so i was level one the entire game but had I don't know, three experience points or execution points or something. So I played the entire game pacifist route without realizing because I had accidentally killed one enemy that I was already locked out of the pacifist route. Um, So the game seemed like it had a fairly underwhelming end game uh, until the final conflict for me. And uh, so that was a little bit personally disappointing. But I I can't deny like how interesting mechanically and narratively this game is and the frankly alarming community that surrounded it over the years um this i'm not sure i've ever seen a true true indie ass rpg have this much of a fervent following and i mean whether something counts as indie like i mean technically uh, a a big successful independent studio like i don't know like like a super giant games is still an indie game but this was a game that was almost entirely developed by one person except for some of the more complicated uh i think graphics processing but but this game is 90 plus percent the work of one person which is crazy to think about for how fleshed out it is and how successful it is um and i i know that's not important to the act of playing the game that it was made by one guy uh but that just makes the entire total package that much more impressive to me but i i i played it in one sitting with a few short breaks in a in a single day and i uh um i still have uh i treasure that memory because this is a hell of a game but it's just i i just didn't think of it as a uh, top 10 ps4 rpg yeah i i think undertale is interesting because it, the memification of undertale um Pro- probably also clouds it negatively for me which, I, is, I, I, which is not undertale's fault i know but it's right but this is this was that's how i made my list and i i think it's interesting because like i was doing like this independent study with um three students who were like didn't want to take english class but they wanted to play video games so i was like all right 
let's do like a game design class where you're just kind of studying video games. Alex helped me a little bit with it. So thanks, Alex. Um, and one of the first games I had them play was Undertale. And I was like, it, we're going to talk about this. You've got to play Undertale. And they're like, ah, the memes. Um, and they all played it and all three of those kids loved it. And I think that one of the things that is interesting about Undertale to me is the simplicity of it. Um, and I think that's obviously partially because of the one person designing it. But if you think about something like Delta Rune, with which at least at this point is so opaque, like I don't really know where it's going. Um, but Undertale has such a, it, it's not doing anything like extremely complex philosophically, but what it does, it does so powerfully. Um, I think through the mix of the tones that it's doing, the gameplay is fun, but simple. Um, but like the message itself is also very simple, but also extremely powerful. And I think the fact that it wraps it in these gameplay mechanics that we understand um, does a much better job of sort of poking at, rpgs than to me something like moon which was not as fun to play um so i think undertale is massively important and massively interesting for what it is and also the simplicity of its presentation i think is also part of what really impresses me about it yeah i think the simplicity is a, a really great point um specifically just in terms of like yeah like everything it's doing like is is quite uh simple other than like the all like the coding and like little like easter eggs and secrets you can find on on different playthroughs but i mean like ultimately what what gave this game like such an impact for me is like the fact that it's just like in conversation with like the rpg genre especially the jrpg genre and just the ways that it presents what seems like a classic like 8-bit, 16-bit RPG experience and then just, like, has all these subtle differences that just develop and become, like, very much their own thing. Like, as somebody who who grew up with these games along with the rest of you, um, it just hit really well and really hard for me. Um, so, so yeah, that whole, like, just the way it, it flips the script on everything is just really, really clever. And the dialogue's so fun in the battles as you're having those conversations. Like you really have to role play in interesting ways. Um, yeah, I, I I think I'm playing this game again soon and I'm excited to do it. I should probably replay Undertale with a better understanding of how the routes work. Um, but it would probably have to be on a new system so it doesn't remember my original playthrough. <laughs> um <laughs> what, I, 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 I played I played it on PC originally. I will say, like, if you've already done like a new so first of all like you, you got uh, yeah like, I, I did a, i did a neutral route playthrough but I, I finished the game at level one with like three experience points so you technically have to do a neutral route playthrough if you don't like get like a single execution point you do get kind of like fast tracked to the the pacifist ending but really what you experience is what any other player would experience on their first run unless they did like a full genocide playthrough so you got like the you you started like the Undertale experience. You just have to have to finish it at this point. All right, so I, I guess that's enough about Undertale. Um, a a very very impactful game that finishes fourth on our list of best PS4 games, and third is a perhaps puzzlingly, and correct me if I'm off here. I think this is the only game on this whole list that's a PS4 exclusive. That is only playable on PS4 and 5, which again, again, 5 can play all the PS4 games, but has is not available on any other system in any way. Uh, and that's a game we also had uh, two episodes on uh, around six months ago or so. Bloodborne. Um, Bloodborne is a, you know, I, I would say part of the greater From Souls series. It finished in the uh, on the top 10 lists. For uh, three of us, Zach, Alex, and myself, all um, rate Bloodborne very highly. And you know, you know, I'll um, because I I didn't uh, I, I didn't start off Disco Elysium or Undertale. I'll start off this one. Um, Bloodborne is really a triumph of sort of mechanics and tone and uh, and and setting all at once because uh, it's it's set in this extremely grim gothic world that has plague and blood and darkness everywhere um and uh but the moment to moment action is so exciting uh they give you the the main character has all kinds of 
uh, of efficacy and agility and weapon variety and uh, and the um, the basic attacks and dodges all feel so satisfying. But it's also a very dangerous world because the enemies in the very starting area can kill you very easily if you're not careful. But the boss fights are like are both grotesque and intense and exciting. Um, but I, I think the most special part of Bloodborne uh, might be the setting because uh, Yarnum and the and its the, the surrounding environs are interconnected and layered in such a way that it, it it's it, it's more exciting and rewarding the more you explore the uh, you when you find a shortcut back to a safe zone so it's easier to get further later. Um, it's always uh, it, it, it's always good and in like the first Dark Souls is successful on that same principle but i don't think uh any souls game i've played which is again only demon souls dark souls one and bloodborne really balances that ex that uh those things of awesome boss fights awesome environments like environment uh, connect uh, connected environments build variety and a uh a tone that's just bleak and uh fascinating i'm not sure i've played an action rpg that's so successful on all of those th fronts at the same time and uh frankly just thinking about bloodborne and talking about bloodborne makes me kind of want to start a new run through of bloodborne using different weapons and maybe uh exploring a little bit further than i did in my first run um uh seven months ago or whenever that was but uh i, I mean I, zach and alex i was on that podcast with both of you so i know all three of us love bloodborne uh let's talk about it some more uh, Zach, you in particular, um, Bloodborne was number two overall on your list. Mm -hmm. So I, I know you, uh, this game affected you a great deal. And it's probably number, I don't know, number three overall in games for me at this point. So I, I've played all the Soulsborne games. Uh, Bloodborne is still at the top of my list because of all the reasons you were talking about. I think that um, one of the complaints about later Soulsborne games is that they don't have an interconnected world in the same way, although obviously Elden Ring does it differently. but I feel like that sense of discovery and that sense of shortcuts and the way that the world is connected in Bloodborne is really, really fascinating. And it feels like it's really whole space. Um, and the lore is cool. And this, the, the vibes are just like excellent. I just love, I've played through all the new game cycles at this point of Bloodborne. And every time it's still an enjoyable experience because uh, every time I get to that boss, I, I'm just excited for like my new weapon and how I'm going to approach that boss. And the combat yeah. feels just so good. Like I love the the ability to get your get your hit power back uh, when you are attacking, and it's a mechanic that works super well in Bloodborne because the enemies are a little more aggressive. Um, but that also means that you need to be more aggressive because you can get um, some of your uh, your your blood back. So. Um, it's just environmentally stunning. Um, the storytelling, if you once you read up about it a little bit, is really excellent. Um, I, I just think that it is the apex of From's catalog in so many ways, um, and it's one of my favorite games of all time. And uh, yeah, I'm I'm so glad that I played it for the podcast because I wouldn't have started it without that. I was interested in Bloodborne before the podcast because I had played Demon Souls a year earlier, and I was and I was interested in playing more. But I was still a little bit intimidated by them because, I mean, the the From Souls games, which is the, what I prefer to call them, but there's a lot of things you could you could call it Soulsborne or Soulsborne Ring or uh, Hidetake Miyazaki specials or whatever, uh, whatever you prefer, uh, Hidetaka Miyazaki. But um, it, it it did take the podcast to me to finally uh, start it, and I'm so glad I did because I, I mean I mean just talking about the combat about it some more. If Dark Souls and Demon Souls are about like extreme patience and taking things methodically and a game like Devil May Cry is a game about being as aggressive and mashy as possible, uh, Bloodborne really walks the line in between those um, where you still have to manage your stamina and be extremely careful of everything around you, but it rewards aggression because you can br break enemy stances easily and uh, and recover lost health by attacking enemies if you do so uh, in the tight enough window. It, um, it, it found a way to encourage players to be more aggressive than the somewhat turtly uh, strategies employed by a lot of Dark Souls players, including me, uh, literally this week. 
I, I probably couldn't have beaten the game without a uh, 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 heavy use of parrying with medium shields or just tanking with a great shield. But and and you can't do that in Bloodborne. But it's Bloodborne is the, the combat in it is so good and it's so successful on every front that uh, it's my favorite of the only three uh, From Souls games I've played. But yeah, it, it's a special game. It, it finished fifth on my list, higher than Hades, which tells you something. Yeah. So um, even though Bloodborne isn't um, my favorite of the bunch, uh, I do think it's probably the closest to perfection. Uh, I think it's just got the most going for it in terms of just like balance and just the thing as a whole. Um, because like it's not like you were just talking about Soulsly. It's it's not the first time Souls Combat felt good. Like Souls Combat definitely had its own thing going on in those earlier games and made the most of it but it is the first time like any of these souls games felt like a legitimate like top tier action game and uh so much of that is because of the the trick weapons and how much you could do with them and like how there's more kind of player expression with the way they can transform mid combo and everything and the of course like the the blood mechanic which just encourages you to just be more aggressive and when these like monstrous enemies are like just yelling in your ears the entire time like that ends up being like like it 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 interacts really well with kind of the the horror theme the game is going for because you need to be on top of things um but also you are just like fighting like the most grotesque monster you'll you'll ever find in a game um so yeah i mean bloodborne is 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 pretty much perfect uh don't have too much to add other than what you guys have said great game so Kyle, I asked you a version of this question earlier. Are you three percent more likely to try a From Souls game now? Um, I am three percent more likely to try Bloodborne, without a doubt. I'm still the whole kind of Souls like genre still makes me a lot of nervous. Um, but uh, this is not the first time I've heard. Um, the majority of you wax poetically about Bloodborne, and and if I had to, if I had to play one, it, I think that would be an easy choice for me. Yeah, it's it's a great starting point. It's it was mine. Um, and I hate to sound like a, a get good jerk or something, but that's 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 actually the opposite of what I mean. Like these games, the rhetoric about them is always like difficulty, 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 and I find it exhausting. Um, it, 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 this game is about if this game is about the feeling of the environment this game is about exploration it's about discovery like is it hard yeah i mean it's it's hard but it's actually not like that much harder than like another action game once you get the rhythm of it um i, I can't say that for necessarily every soulsborne title but this one i think that's very true with um and i think it's a great starting point yeah like with undertale it's like don't don't let what the community's done with the game put you off like it's it's got its own thing going and and a lot more appeal beyond like what a lot of the fans like obsess over and and focus on it's definitely worth a shot at least yeah continuing my uh two and a half years and counting of comparing souls games to monster hunter games um th these are these aren't brutally challenging games at like the dexterity level or uh sophistication level these, these are just games of learning like you you learn your the environment you learn your move set you learn the enemy's movements and you can succeed it's just sometimes it it requires some persistence sometimes maybe you'll you'll hit a wall until you get an epiphany and then the rest of the game is much easier um but but you need to approach them with patience and don't listen to what the community says like maybe listen to what they say if they tell you go up instead of down in, in the beginning of Dark Souls. But uh, uh, beyond that, um, you just, just go in there with an open mind and you'll discover, in, I feel, one of the truly uh, best series of video games uh, or, or greater oeuvres of video games in the last decade or so. And, and don't be afraid to summon. Like, oh, yeah. Like, the community treats it like it's an improper way of playing the game. Like, the, the series was designed with summoning in mind. Like, if you're struggling through something, summon, like, an NPC or another player. They'll help you out, and you'll be able to continue enjoying the game. Yeah, and there's, there's even story implications and fun around summoning that, uh, whatever, don't listen to the toxic elements of the fan base is the uh, moral of yeah. the story always here. Yeah, if you're playing through and you want to summon me, anytime. I freaking love this game.
Now, and, and I don't say this with any rudeness, but um, Bloodborne is a bit of a toxic game because there's so much poison and life loss in it and plague in it. And not, not because of the attitude. But I, moving on from Bloodborne, I want to talk about what I think is maybe the least toxic game on this list. <laughs> because maybe this is my bias talking. Okay, it's definitely my bias talking. I mean, nothing communicates JRPG wholesomeness to me more than Dragon Quest. And number two on this list um, is my number one favorite PS4 RPG, uh, Dragon Quest XI. Um, I uh, played it in 2018 when it came out on the PS4, and I recently replayed the expanded version, Dragon Quest XI S, uh, right at the beginning of 2024, and we did two podcasts on it that you can listen to if you if you choose. Um, I, I think Dragon Quest XI is as close to a perfect turn-based RPG as there's ever been. Um, there, uh, the, the movement around the world feels fast and the, and the turn-based combat feels snappy, even though it's turn-based, but it has enemies visible on the screen. So you're not, uh, beholden to the combat like a, uh, like a game with random encounters, whether you like random encounters or not, like it's, it's nice to be able to have some choice in the matter, like in 11. Um, I, I love the cast here so much. They, represent the eight main playable classes or eight of the nine playable classes in dragon quest three while each being fully fleshed out in their own right and great characters that get their specific story moment at different points and uh, just extremely fun personalities overall uh the, the the tone of the story sort of starts out subverting classic japanese rpg tropes and then eventually falls into them but then pulls them off as successfully as uh as just about any uh rpg ever at least in my very biased opinion but th this whole game just makes me feel so much joy even in the darker moments of it because uh it 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 just hit, it it hits classic dragon quest notes so perfectly that um most of these mechanics could have been in an rpg 30 years ago but instead they feel absolutely fun and classic in this game um and uh and there's a, a some controversy uh, it, for people that are, that love dragon quest on whether the third act of this game is good or not because it uh Ugh, it's yeah great it's uh, yeah amazing. it it it, un, it <laughs> undoes parts of act two but in a way that makes me feel like you've seen a puzzle break apart and fall yeah. on the floor and then you get to put it back together again in a way that is, I in the puzzle analogy is much stronger in Dragon Quest Seven, but uh, I I love almost everything about Dragon Quest Eleven, and I, uh, I I was almost worried when I played it earlier this year that it wouldn't hold up to my memory of it, but it absolutely did, and anyone that loves RPGs should play it, even if they have qualms about Dragon Quest or or haven't played a Dragon Quest game. I, I again, but it's it's number one on my damn list. Of course, I have such uh, positive feelings about it. Yeah, I mean, if I was going to recommend someone to play a traditional turn-based RPG, this would be the one. Um, it, it, it's just, it, I, you, you hit the nail on the head. It is a perfect RPG. Like, there are almost no flaws to it. Um, as Alex said about Bloodborne, I think that's also true here. I think it is extremely well-paced. Even when you're revisiting areas that you've seen before, they're recontextualized, and there's something else interesting going on in that town. Like, the moment-to-moment -moment storytelling is so Dragon Quest, but also modernized in a way that that isn't too modern, but it, that it makes sense. Um, it gives you the... And I think that the third act is so perfect because it shows you how much can be done with this turn-based system. Outside of the story implications, like, this turn-based system is, is very, like, Dragon Quest, I don't know, four to some degree, right? But it it allows you to, like, experiment with these different um you know buff combinations and how many turns are you going to do a fight in and things like that and it's just it, it's such a wholesome game I, I played it in like i don't know eight days and i was at work <laughs> so i freaking love this game um the fact that it only finished seventh on my list is an indication of how strong i think the ps4 library is because i absolutely love this game um and zach i don't i don't mean to insult you but I ha I do notice that I mean uh, I'm not sure if Undertale counts or not, but I think this might be the only fully turn-based game on your list. Holy crap! Yeah, really? That's wild. 
uh, unless I mean, well, uh, well, uh, well, oh, no, other than Disco Elysium, right? But that, but that, but that game That's also turn based. Oh it, well, yeah, it, it doesn't yeah. exactly have turn based combat. So oh, yeah, I, 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 I'm just thinking that Zach, may, maybe you're. <laughs> uh, and again, everybody's I, got a type. I'm, I'm not. Tr- I'm not trying to. I'm not trying to insult you, Zach, but I think that maybe your your PS4 era sensibilities don't value turn based combat a lot, but except for Dragon Quest XI. <laughs> wow. I because if you asked me, this is crazy. If you asked me like what kind of RPG that I like, I would have told you a turn based <laughs> turn based is first. So I that that's wild. You Thank can you, you can that out. yeah you can double check yeah. my work if you want. But no, it's, you're but right. It's, I'm it's like, yeah, right the, now. This is the only <laughs> game with turn based combat on your list. That's crazy. Wow. Yeah, you're right. I mean, anyway, I, I don't Dragon I don't Quest have Eleven's great. <laughs> I don't have a ton with turn based combat on my list. Well. Mm, yeah, well, m- m- more than you, but not not a lot more than you. I guess the, um, the PS4 era was just a time when the action RPG could thrive, except for Dragon Quest XI, which is um yeah. Uh, there was even uh, when there was rumors that it would have action based combat. Um, there was a minor outcry. Oh yeah. But no uh, way. but um, what they ultimately decided though was like, yeah, we thought about turn uh, turn based combat, but didn't like it, so we just changed it so you could move characters around in combat, so it looked more natural if you wanted to. Uh. We would, but I would, I still sort of would keep the lining up on opposite sides anyway. Uh, because you know what I mean? Like, the there's the, there's a setting you can change in battle to so yeah. that you're sort of your characters are sort of walking around each other, yeah, uh, I, in between, yeah, it, pointlessly, I, but yes, <laughs> yeah, I, I don't love it, but it is an option. Um, but uh, Alex, you're you had it on your list as well, almost as high as I did, it's it, it's third on your personal list, so uh. Uh, but you, I didn't podcast about this game with you earlier this year. So, um, what are your feelings in Dragon Quest XI? Yeah, I, I didn't make that podcast just because I, I didn't have time to to put another hundred plus hours into the game. But it, it's absolutely one of my my favorite RPGs. Uh, I, I think it is the the most perfect RPG I've ever played. Um, I played it. I was playing it at the time that the pandemic hit, and I just remember like having my switch in handheld mode, I was playing the, the definitive edition um, and just like absorbing like kind of that, that warm nourishing spirit you were describing earlier, Solosi. And just I like the game gave me hope for the world while there was very little hope in sight, um, which is an amazing feat for a game to accomplish. And um, on the one hand, like, like the, I love having like the monsters, like, out in like that you could like see them in the overworld and you can dodge them because like i thought the game was like it allowed you to like customize your difficulty a little bit because i I remember like just dashing through a lot of the early dungeons just like get to the boss like and like that allowed me like to keep the difficulty fairly high because i felt pretty comfortable with the turn-based combat uh while also just shortening my play time and oh my god like many rpgs could use that function right um and I, I mean, I guess we are getting it a lot more with re-releases and remasters having uh, turning off random encounters. But Dragon Quest XI had it just baked into its design, which is great. Uh, but the highlight for me personally is probably like just the the towns in the game. Like I love every single town and the way it's designed and the way it feels like spatially unique. Um, it's just like a lot of fun to just like run and jump around all these like different places. But even more impressive is just like how much depth they were able to put into like every like seemingly insignificant npc like across the game's three acts because if you're spending as much time just hanging out in towns and talking to npcs as i did like you actually learn so much about each of these kind of insignificant characters and they all have like arcs that they go on and when like act three hits and like little like time distortion things go on then you kind of like see like a whole other path to them than if you like when you're talking to them in act two and it's like it's kind of like mind-blowing like how much like writing is in this game that you could like completely skip over but if you take the time to digest like actually like creates like one of the most like fully realized worlds like i've ever encountered in an rpg and um yeah so so that on top of like the tightness of the design um just just really made this game like hit hit really well for me uh, I don't want to spend too much time talking about Dragon Quest XI because this podcast is already running quite long, and uh, we just did two episodes on it earlier this year. 
But uh, Kyle, I know you've never played a Dragon Quest game to completion before. Um, do you think you're a little interested in Dragon Quest XI now, or are you gonna wait for the uh, HD two D remake of three because it's about it's gonna be about a quarter as long? <laughs> uh, yes, I am interested in both. Um, I have played Dragon Quest XI. I've started it twice. Um, the farthest I've made is sort of just kind of creeped into Act Two, um, and uh, and then just kind of fell off. Um, but I I do I did enjoy my time that second kind of run through quite a bit. Uh, I for some reason I've always struggled to to connect with Dragon Quest, but I I am extremely interested in both the uh, 11s version, um, and you know perhaps on the on the Switch so that I can be a little bit more on the go with it. Um, and the the remakes for sure, cause, especially as somebody who completely missed the first three Dragon Quests for multiple reasons, but for them all to get HD remakes coming up, um, I'm I'm very interested. Me too. I think also um, one thing that's in the S version that wasn't in the original is that you can play uh, battles at um, 50% higher speed. Oh, nice. um, always they, here they, for that. Yeah, there's yep. a, there's a fast forward option if you've like if you've seen the animations once and you're just good to make it go through faster. I mean, I and that's how I played it, and maybe that helped it. That helped me keep my play time to only around 80 hours instead of 110. <laughs> but uh, yeah, I, I can't recommend Dragon Quest XI enough. Uh, but that finishes second on our list. And listeners, um, I, I I'm gonna speculate a little bit here. I'm imagining that you're now thinking either one either you're thinking between two games for the number one overall spot one of which is correct and the other one is perhaps shockingly not on our list uh but we'll, maybe we'll talk about that at the that other one at the end of the episode but uh the number one game on our list um finished in the uh top four for alex the top two for me and is zach's uh i believe favorite video game of all time or close to it, if not. That that or sweep it in two. Yeah. Okay. Right. <laughs> we've, we've talked about that one before as well, and that <laughs> we that game finished number one on our PS one uh, ranking list from a couple of years ago. Yeah. So if you don't mind, Zach, do you want to uh, kick this one off for us? Uh, it's a game that um, I played for the first time for this podcast, I believe, in 2020, a few months before the world changed. But this yeah. is another one, another game about a a world changing, you could say. Yeah, so our number one choice is Near Automata, which uh, <laughs> uh, if you heard that I was on this podcast, you had to know it was going to finish somewhere on this list. Um, Near Automata is uh, not a perfect RPG, which I think is the opposite of what we've said about the last two, but it is it embraces messiness. Um, so I, I think when I think about Near Automata, I can't ever not think about the ending, which I don't want to spoil. Um, but this is a game, I think, Fundam uh, fundamentally about what it is to be human and it uses gameplay systems in a way that is not always necessarily fun but is always thematically relevant um and i, I think that the, the combat in near automata is fun but not amazing like, like platinum helped it's good uh the world design like it's not really an open world i also made my three students play near automata and they weren't very impressed by it which i was not happy with um and it, it it has so much of human messiness around the edges, but I think that what it does better than any RPG is it gets to my philosophy about what life is, about what we should be doing, about who we should be, about what we should embrace and what we shouldn't embrace. Um, and that is all very vague because <laughs> I never want to spoil this game for anyone who hasn't played it, but it is... Um, such an important game narratively it treats it as a video game and it does things narratively that only a video game could do and that is not something that happens nearly often enough um, i think it's special the music is unimpeachable and it is uh, it, it's just a special video game and if you don't like it i am convinced that you haven't gotten to the last ending <laughs> no offense kyle some offense I was literally about to say, at me, bro. No, I'm, I, <laughs> I'm on. I'm on record as uh, as understanding that um, I am not correct about Nier Automata, and and I am okay with that. Well, the, the the first step is admitting that you're wrong. Um, 
But because I, I mean, we did talk about this on an episode not too long ago about uh, uh, it was about RPGs that are loved and popular or we, that you wanted to like but struggled to like. And and um, you one of your submissions for that episode was Near Automata, Kyle. Oh. Uh, I, I I I played this game in early 2020, like I mentioned before. I knew it by reputation. I knew it was about androids and science fiction and uh and had incredible music so i and i knew bits and pieces about it that were accurate but not the whole story and i was just consistently blown away by it it's like this game it it does some things that are kind of within the expected realm of science fiction like i don't want to talk about specific plot points but it's like some of these things were like oh yeah i i I get the story going this way but then things would happen that i just had never even thought about in a video game before or uh and and things that um were so w- notes that were so impressive i was in in minor shock about them and uh, this it, it's a messy emotional story that's uh not even easy to understand until you until it's uh maybe presented to you more easy uh in, in a different way later in the same game but uh i i I, I I think about this game and I just think about the the overwhelming tragedy happening to certain characters and the setting and the wild places the story goes and the ways that the gameplay and narrative would consistently surprise or shock me without ever really losing um uh without without ever really losing its tone or its message um and uh, and it's a game that I I, I don't I don't want to spoil the ending, but it's a game that I played and loved. I did not platinum it, even though you can just buy trophies from uh, a late game NPC if you've missed them earlier in the game, which is I, I think very funny. This is, that just sort of goes to show how uh, it gets, it even it's even thematically relevant. Yeah, so I mean, it's uh, <laughs> yeah, it's thematically uh, sensible, but also I think it goes to how little Yoko Taro thinks of trophies, <laughs> <laughs> but um or or achieve or game achievements, but uh. I don't know if I ever want to play it again because that first experience and ending and my choice at the end of the ending was so powerful to me. I don't know if I want to experience it again, it, but but not because it was harrowing or uh, or soul crushing in a way that it was just so yeah. it was it was just so beautiful and perfect. It's like if I were to replay the game, it would be to show to someone else and not yeah. for my own satisfaction, because I, I can hard I can't I can hardly imagine being more like more moved and satisfied by a game's ending but it's it's whatever near automata is wonderful yeah i mean i've played i've played all the way through this game three times not like you know the multiple endings and the and and you've seen you've seen ending e three times correct and every time i've seen it it's been like a particular moment in my life and it's a moment that i've needed that message um so yeah it's real good uh, and then this is semi serious, but also semi a joke. Um, my girlfriend has not played this game. I've thought about playing it with her to show it to her and also so she could experience it. But I also kind of don't because I'm worried that it there is a non zero chance that it causes us to break up. <laughs> it, it, it's it, it's it's that kind she's of not game. Not gonna like it. <laughs> no, no, no. I, I'm worried that it just might drag her down emotionally to a degree that she. <laughs> The, oh. <laughs> I, I, it's, it's so uplifting like it's so beautiful like so it, much about this it looks darkness in the hours. face and it says that isn't real it's so beautiful sorry there's i understand nothing your point, though. yeah there's nothing that's not that is uplifting about the first four hours of that game holy but there's nothing that's uplifting about most of life. <laughs> that's my point. Like it's it, it's that ending that convinces me every time that there is something that is that is worth it. Um, it's so freaking good. Zach, do two of your favorite RPGs of all time sing about the weight of the world? Somebody check on Zach. <laughs> I'm good. <laughs> Zach, Zach, you know the joke I was telling right there. I actually um, don't. What, what other? What else sings about the weight of the world? Isn't "Weight of the World" a, a song in Xenoblade Three? A uh, weight of life. Weight of life. Close. Oh no. <laughs> uh, maybe I should. Maybe I should play about. Maybe I should play Boo. these games before I talk about them. No, it's okay. <laughs> Dang it. All right. Weight oh, thank, of life is a. Oh, thanks for the booze, song. Kyle. Well, this <laughs> yeah. is your last. I guess this is your last episode of Retro Encounter. Yeah. Hey, you know what? Made it worth it. So, uh, so, so, Alex, um, I know you've also played Near Automata. It finished fourth on your list overall, but you've been a little quiet here. Uh, um, I mean, again, 
we're already at two and a half hours or almost there. Uh, what are your overall feelings on your automata? I mean, I don't have to add too much to what, what y'all have said already. It was great. Uh, I wrote a thing on it uh, that people can check out. It's on the site. Uh, if you want to get my thoughts on it, um, all I'll say is um, like Bloodborne and Witcher 3 were like the first games I played on the PS4 and I played them like kind of like they were both like part of what my friends had already had at the time. Uh, but Nier Automata was the first game I, I bought um and f- it was because i i knew i'd love it and i don't even remember why i knew that um i don't know what i what i read about it or what uh, or if i just like heard some of the music or something or like saw like the concept art i don't know but i knew i'd love it and i started it on that communal ps4 and it was it was separated from me before i could finish um and so i had to wait a couple of years until i finally had my own ps4 and was able to play through the whole thing uh, and it was great. It was an emotional journey, just like as Zach was describing. And um, yeah, like just the way this game plays with like perspective, how like your your character is like framed in in the scene, how it plays with genre, shifts through different genres, like to accommodate like the different narrative moments that are happening and like the story twists as well. Like all those things to me just like as I was playing the game felt like an absolute like revelation in advancing, like how games can be like expressive as a medium. And um, it's a great game. Yeah. <sighs> so is that it? Are we done? Do we have, do we have our top 11? We do. All right. But we do need to very briefly talk about what's missing before we go. We should. Um, <laughs> I mean, uh, Persona five only finished near on two people's lists. I had it 10th and Alex had it eighth. And so it's a game I think is very, very good, perhaps, obviously. Yeah. But, I mean, not everybody loves Persona 5. And, uh, again, I, I picked nine games that I love more than Persona 5. Um, we don't need to go deep into it, but I, I had a feeling going in, some people were expecting Persona 5 the whole time but never got it. Uh, which, is, which I have, you know, apologies to Persona 5 fans, but then uh, maybe no apologies to Persona 5 fans. You've, 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 plenty of people love Persona 5. Yeah, I mean, Persona 5 is a really good game, but I think it is thematically flat. Um, but, if this has... e- but if this episode was best PS4 menus... Sure. We're talking about top three games. Yeah. 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 I, I, there are so many things I love about Persona 5, but it, it, it doesn't accomplish, I think, what it sets out to accomplish with the themes that it's trying to tackle, um, which I think earlier Persona games did. Uh, which I think weakens it. Um, so it would have been top 15 for me um, because the combat's phenomenal. I do like turn-based combat, I promise. Um, because the dungeon exploration is excellent, but I, for me, it, it doesn't land in all the ways it needs to to be a top 10 RPG. I, I think that the uh, the combat is very smooth. It, it's a very stylish game with gorgeous menus. Um, but it, it's its themes are consistent but it doesn't i think that after a while it um it 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 falls a little flat like the uh there isn't as much excitement in the late game as there are in the early game and i think that that uh earlier persona games hit many of the same or similar themes and do it better again like um it probably finishes uh, i've i've played uh five persona games to completion all of them except for one and i think it finishes would finish fourth or fifth for me um, but it, but Persona Five is great. It's just, it's Persona is one of my favorite series. I just like uh, several PS4 games more. But um, there's a lot of games that we voted for that got po- po- uh, points but didn't finish in our top eleven. Uh, for Zach, you had votes for Dark Souls Three, The Witcher Three, Near Replicant, Elden Ring, and uh, and and that's all. Everything else on your list finished in the in the eleven. For me, it was Persona Five Royal, uh, Thirteen Sentinels, Aegis Rim, which I had ninth. Um, Yakuza Like a Dragon. And Hades that uh, finished out that did not finish in the top eleven. Uh, Alex, you had I think fewer than Zach or I. Um, uh, Final Fantasy fifteen, Persona five Royal, and The Witcher three uh, did not make the top eleven. And then Kyle, the real maverick of the uh, four of us, <laughs> um, you I think had uh, six games that did not finish in the top eleven. Uh, the Trials of Mana remake, Yakuza Like a Dragon, Final Fantasy Type Zero, uh, The Legend of Heroes: Trails of Cold Steel, Banner Saga two. Tales of Arise and Divinity Original Sin 2. Well, it's seven, not six. But uh, so so um, we had a 
some consensus, at least with the uh, uh, with the top three. Um, those are games that Zach, uh, Alex, and I all voted for. But uh, I mean, there's a, a pretty a pretty diverse set of opinions here. I thought about FF7 remake and Trials of Mana remake, and uh, and Tales of Arise for like my nine or ten spots, but but couldn't really get there. I because of the arbitrary rules I set for myself, I couldn't include some uh, PS4 remade games. Uh, but ultimately, I think this is a very very good list that represents the four of us uh, very well, even if there's no Persona Five on it. Yeah, I think it's a really interesting list. Um, and I think that the justifications that everybody provided for why they're there are legitimate. It, it's just a, it, it's a stacked console. Uh, if we yeah. were to re-record that best console for RPGs today, I think it would be closer. I think so. I mean, I mean, um, I think the PS4 era was just ending when we recorded that episode. Mm -hmm. But now I'm I'm wondering if this was, especially because like online storefronts and online multiplayer were as good or better as they ever were on the uh, or like that, that was when the first time it truly became global was on the PS4 and i i i mean it it really does feel like a golden age especially compared to the uh Sony's weaker showing on the PS3 mm -hmm. and the fact that many PS5 games are still coming out with PS4 versions just a uh, um is a you know uh demonstrates the staying power of that of that console but um, before we move into housekeeping, I have one last question, and I urge all of us to keep it to one or two sentences um, because this episode has already been so long. Um, is there a game that you have not played that was mentioned today that you think you're close to playing because of today's discussion or your other preconceived opinions about that game or games? I'll go first. Uh, it's probably Dark Souls 3. <laughs> <laughs> only be only because i mean i'm a bit in a soul's mindset right now i uh uh just talking about bloodborne and recently playing dark souls one has me excited to play more and dark souls three might be the next one i play but uh does, does anyone else have a game that we that was mentioned today in some point that they're that you think you're close to playing or trying out later um probably monster hunter world um although i don't know if i'll get to it before the next one but um i'm just interested in monster hunter at this point and i everything you said made me more interested yeah i think 13 sentinels for me is just just near the bottom of your list solosi but that's definitely one that uh i've been planning to play and i will definitely do so sometime soon but Same. also also obviously endwalker um one day one day i i want to play endwalker the the problem is i'm worried about what final fantasy 14 does to me <laughs> yeah that's the, that's the issue. Uh, I think for me, it's probably Hades. Um, it's just it's something I I've always had in the back of my mind, and and I, I'm definitely closer to playing it today than I would have been otherwise. Yeah. Right on. Uh, so thank you so much, uh, Zach, Kyle, and Alex for for joining me today. This is a, this was a long one. We had a lot of games to discuss, and I think it was a. Uh, it was at least an interesting discussion for up speaking personally, but um, the retro encounter is a podcast full of many dis interesting di discussions, except once a year or so we throw discussions out and just try to have a RPG knowledge measuring contest between us. Uh, next week we are doing another quiz show. It's been, it's a lot of work preparing these. So this might be the last quiz show I ever do, but uh, uh, Zach, you're going to be on that because I can say it now. We're bringing f together the five previous champions of RPG Fan Quiz Show oh, to, to determine who is the true RPG Quiz Show champion in the non Solosi division. Dun, I, already dun, dun. I, I already have predictions, and it ain't me. <laughs> I have. A f I, I feel like we might have the same prediction, but I'm not yeah. going to. I'm not going to say. I'm not going to say anything. Um, but also later in July, I've mentioned it a couple times. I very, very recently finished Dark Souls. Um, just a uh, less than forty eight hours ago, um, and that's our game for July. We're doing two episodes on the first Dark Souls, not the first Souls, but the first Dark one, uh, which was a twenty eleven PS three and Xbox three sixty game that has since been uh, remastered. So it's uh it's quite easy to find on PS four, in fact. And I thought that game was excellent. Spoiler alert! But we're gonna spend two full episodes discussing it later this month. And you know what? Uh. We, I think we've already alluded to it. Um, in August, we're playing Dragon Age Inquisition, 
which I'm going to start very, very soon and hopefully be ready to record two episodes on coming out in August. But uh, that's about all I'm ready to discuss for now. Uh, I still have quiz questions to write before we record that quiz show episode. Um, and uh, I'm looking forward to seeing how that goes, Zach. I know you are, too. I mean, sort of. <laughs> I, know, I know I'm going to lose. <laughs> That's exactly the right mindset to go into if you're intending to win. <laughs> but uh, listeners, um, we hope you enjoyed the discussion today. If you want to email us questions about the PS4 or Dark Souls or Dragon Age or why Persona 5 should have been on the list, the best way to, to come into contact with us is to email retro at rpgfan.com. You can also find RPG fans' presences on Facebook, Instagram, Threads, Twitter, Twitch, YouTube, Discord, um, always either RPG Fan or RPG Fan Com. Um, we all, our RPG Fan also has two other podcasts in the RPG Fan Podcast Network, Random Encounter every two weeks about randomness and what games we're playing, and Rhythm Encounter every other two weeks about RPG music. Uh, please leave us reviews at re Retro, Random, or Rhythm Encounter on YouTube, Spotify, Apple Podcasts, or however you're listening to us. We love feedback. But our favorite version of feedback is if you go to rpgfan.com slash shop and uh, and support RPG Fan with your wallet. On the uh, on a shop hosted by Tee Public, you can buy RPG Fan emblazoned merch like coffee mugs, phone cases, of all, all kinds of apparel and other things. And as, as well as a, uh, a book hosted by Hyperplay RPG, a UK-based publisher that, um, uh, that helped us release a 300-page book containing around 300 one-page one reviews from RPG fans' history. Um, uh, both of those storefronts are super great, and we would love for you, for you to support us that way. But if you want to support us by leaving us messages on social media or email, let's tell the listeners how to do that as well, uh, starting with you, Alex. You can just email me at alexfranacek at gmail.com. Now, Kyle. Yeah, on Twitter, X, uh, or X, whatever they're calling it, at KyleRPGFan. Now, Zach. Uh, you can email me, ZachW at RPGFan.com, or you can find me on our Discord as ZachW. And listeners, I am on the internet most easily found either on RPG Fans Discord, Instagram, or Blue Sky, all of which I am Evoker for Dogs. Now, that's a, that's a PS3 reference. No, no, a Persona 3 reference, which is PS2 and PS5, but not PS4. So I couldn't have had it on my list, but I mean, one of us did have a PS4 port of a PSP game on the list. I'm getting dizzy. So maybe, maybe, maybe I, sh maybe you know, maybe I should just change my whole list and put Persona 4 number one. <laughs> Listeners, thank you. Good night and good luck. Mm -hmm.